Okay, I do believe we are live now. Let's check and make sure. No. Okay, we have a couple students that are joining us uh, via YouTube. So those of you who are joining via YouTube, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I will get with you shortly to answer your questions. Good morning. Um, How many of you guys watch your blood pressure cups and seconds? Oh, we're going to get to that at the end of class today. So that'll be the very last thing we do is blood pressure. We've got three skills to learn first. So quite a bit to do this morning before we get into blood pressure. But blood pressure takes me about an hour and a half to teach you. It's a little bit of a longer skill to learn. Um, it's not hard, but there's a lot going on. So I have to break down each piece to make it make sense to you, and then we'll put it all together, okay? All right, uh, is everybody getting to wrap up emails after class? Is anybody not getting the, you're not getting, you're not, still not? Okay, um, you had Yahoo, right? I did get them when you were working with them, and then I didn't get those on. Okay, all right, and you had the ELL? They'll sound. They'll sound. Um, I'm thinking the filters are probably catching us. That's most likely what's happening. Um, remind me after class and I'll resend last classes. When I resend it manually, a lot of times that'll force it through. Okay. So did you get the ones that I sent on Wednesday? I just when got I a um, advertisement for flashcards. Oh, you got that one. That's the one I got. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that one I sent Thursday that um, basically my server was having issues. So I pushed that email out to see if I could get the server to duplicate the issue. And um, I put flashcards on sale for you guys as you know, <laughs> something to send out. So um, we actually got quite a few flashcard or I'm sorry, card game order, not flashcards, card game orders of that. So it would be me. All right. So happy CNA week. To all of you, this is CNA week. It started on Thursday. It lasts till Wednesday. So if you're not getting the follow up, wrap up emails, make sure you let me know because those really do help you and give you all the links for everything that we covered in class. Over the weekend, you had two chapters of homework reading, chapters two and three, and they were longer, a little bit more boring. <laughs> Um, did you get the reading done and did you take the test? Did you grade the test? Good morning. All right, so um, I'm going to call your names and if you can give me either how many you missed or your grade, remember at the bottom of the um, answer key is your grading scale. So either your grade or how many you missed for chapter two and then chapter three. Jillian? I read it. I didn't do the test. Okay, that's fine. Do you have chapter one for me? Yes, I do. And I got a 95. I missed okay. one. Very good. Jalen? I did it on two. Okay, very good. Tara? I didn't get any wrong. On either one? Nope. Very good. Bernice? I got a 100 on two and an 85 on three. Okay. Gianna, Bailey, Patricia. I got 100 on two and I'm grading. Okay, no worries. Stephanie? You got one on two and two. Perfect. Thank you. Melanie? I missed zero on chapter two and chapter three. Thank you. Jessica? Oh, chapter two and three. Okay, very good. Cynthia? 
Uh, chapter two test, I got one wrong, and then chapter three test, I got two wrong. Okay, very good. JC? Fine. One wrong on chapter two and two wrong on chapter three. All right, Rachel? Um, on chapter two, I got a 90, and then on chapter three, I got a 95. Very good. And Amber? <clears throat> Okay. I just finished reading chapter three. I also very good. All right. So the questions that uh, you missed. So those of you who missed questions, is there anything that you want me to explain to you to go over to um, help you understand why the right answer is the right answer? Any burning questions? I have a question about that. I have a question about vitals from last week. Okay. Um, when I was reading it over during the work, it said that we do it twice for the um, test. Mm -hmm. We don't go through the whole field and do it again. Good question. And that's just on pulse. So that's the only um, skill you would have to do twice because you've got to count with each evaluator. So you'll count with evaluator one, okay. write your answer down, and then you'll count with evaluator number two, do your closing and write your Okay, your so answer. you'll have it. That's if you have two evaluators. And like I said, kind of right now it's hit and miss. Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's one, depending on staffing. But if um, there is a second evaluator, they'll lead you through that process. They don't expect you to know it. So just kind of follow their instructions. You don't have to do your whole opening again. You don't have to do the whole closing again. You're just going to do the counting with each one. And they're going to let you write down that first one mm -hmm. um, because they don't expect you to remember it while you're counting with the second one. Gotcha. That's where I was confused. I was like, yeah, they'll let you write it down. Okay. So um, I know that, that one's a little bit confusing because it's the only one that we have to do twice. But the reason is because if there's two evaluators, each one has to be able to grade you independently. That's the whole point of having two evaluators. Let me give you a little history lesson on this. Um, a couple of years ago, there, were all, there was only one evaluator. That was it. And um, people that failed the test tended to complain to Prometric. Um, she said, I didn't do this. I did it. She said, I didn't do this. I did it. And they kept hearing this over and over and over again. Well, it's a closed testing process. So how do you prove that you did something, right? So there was really no way to defend yourself if you really thought that you were graded incorrectly. There was no real defense. Because, of course, they're going to take the word of the RNs. So... Because they got quite a few of these complaints, the Board of Nursing, Florida's Board of Nursing, had to take it seriously and they had to come up with some sort of a strategy to help you guys. So one of the things that they talked about doing is putting video cameras in the, the testing center so that they could go back and review. So if you said, no, I did that step, they could go back and review at an administrative level to see, you know, were the evaluators missing things. Well, the evaluators did not like that idea. They did not want to be on videotape. So they quickly shut that down. So the only other option available was let's put two evaluators in. That way, if one of them misses it, the other one may pick it up. And as long as on the deficiency list, something is only listed once, it's not gonna count against you because that means that one evaluator wasn't paying attention, the other one saw you do it. Make sense? Okay. So the two evaluator thing is actually for your protection. But in order to be effective, they have to grade independently. That's the whole point of the two evaluators. So that if one isn't watching close enough, the second one will pick it up. Well, because pulse is a measuring skill, they have to be able to measure independently as well. So you're gonna count with the first one, write that down, count with the second one, do your closing, write that down. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a little history on the test. Um, that's why we now have two evaluators. But staffing is staffing. I mean, we're short staffed at, you know, everywhere. There aren't enough RNs to go around. And to take RNs away from bedside nursing, sick patients, 
to put them in a testing center is, you know, unfortunately having an effect in clinical life. So they don't always have the two RNs available to make that independent assessment. So we kind of have to go with what we've got. Does that make sense? The problem is that you don't know what you don't know, okay? Because you're students. So here's a good example. I'm self-taught on everything, technology. So all of uh, these graphics, I actually create in-house here. All the animated videos, those little characters, I actually draw them. I do all the editing. I do all the videotaping. I do all the editing for that. I do all the voiceovers. I do all of that. And I'm self-taught. I also create our websites. So all of that is done by me, self-taught. I had no idea what I was doing. So I did it well enough to get it all up and running and working, right? But because I didn't know what I didn't know, all I knew was what I had taught myself. I don't know where my gaps are, right? So now we're, we're learning that my server is not configured properly. So I had to go out and hire a server person and we're migrating everything over because I did something good enough, I thought, but it really wasn't because there was a gap in my knowledge that I didn't even know. Make sense? Mm -hmm. That's where you guys are. So when you go take the test and you think to yourself, I did that step, you don't know where your gaps are. You may have done the step, but you may not have done it correctly. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. you're looking at it from your own knowledge level not from the RN knowledge level. So when you're looking at those deficiencies, you may think to yourself, oh my gosh, I did that step. But what you, so here's a good one, privacy blanket, right? We put a privacy blanket on anytime the patient's uncovered or undressed. We're dressing the patient. We put the privacy blanket on, but when we do, we pull the sheet all the way down first. So the patient's completely uncovered right? And then we put the privacy blanket on. Well, in your mind, you're thinking, I did the step. I put the privacy blanket on, but did you do it right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So because we expose the patient unnecessarily, you would not get that point. And on your deficiency, all you're going to see is, you know, did not apply or did not um, unnecessarily expose the patient, you know, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So those checkpoints are designed for RNs. So when you call up Prometric and you say, I did that step, they kind of roll their eyes and go, well, yeah, but you may have may not have done it correctly. And that's the part that you may not realize. That kind of makes sense to you? So the way that they're trying to get around that is through a second evaluator, but they're not always available. So our students do really, really well on the state exam, really well. Um, the evaluators will probably tell you, where did you go to class at? Or did you study with Miss Patty? Did you do the four-year CMA thing? Because the way that you're trained is very distinctive. Mm -hmm. And it's going to show up in the training set or the testing center. They're going to be able to, they'll, they'll, They'll notice things that you do that are things that I taught you to do. And you test very, very well because it wouldn't dawn on you not to read the care plan. That, that it wouldn't even be a thing. In fact, you're gonna be looking at other people that aren't reading the care plan, like how do you know what to do, <laughs> right? It wouldn't even cross your mind, but there's a lot of people out there that go to a test prep program, a weekend thing or a week long thing. And all they're taught to do is parrot the motions. And when they get into the test, they don't always do well because they don't have that deeper level of understanding. Why the steps are important. Does that make sense? That's what sets you guys apart. You're gonna test very well, you're gonna pass. More importantly, you're going to do these things out there in the real world where it counts. 
And that's the part that I'm concerned about. Um, but the second evaluator, don't let it throw you. It's actually there for your protection. Okay, good. Any other questions? So I do want to address this. In chapter two, it does talk about the fact that you need 75 hours of training to be a healthcare anything. It's part of OBRA requirements, minimum of 75 hours of training. Well, if you add up the hours that were here, it's only 32. So how does that work? Well, in Florida, Florida's unique. We don't follow anybody's <laughs> rules. We are the outlaw state and we don't abide by OBRA. So Florida is the only state that you can challenge the test. You don't have to have any education, no experience, no nothing. You can just go challenge a test. You can work at checkers and tomorrow go challenge the test with nothing in between. If you pass, congratulations, you're a CNA. The test is designed so that you don't pass it without some sort of knowledge, right? Um, but that 75 hours doesn't apply to Florida. Now, that's kind of important to you though. It's gonna let you test, yay, without having to go through a 120 hour program with clinicals, it's like 900 bucks, like all the other states have to do. So you get off a little bit cheaper. The problem is that when you go to transfer to other states, other states know that Florida is a challenge state. And you may not have that 75 hours that are required. So some other states say, hold up, not so fast. You have to go through our training before you can become certified here. Or you have to take our test before you can be certified here. Now, there's a lot of states that go, oh, yeah, we don't care. You got a CNA certification, send us proof, get a background check, and we'll give you a certification in our state, too because we need you. So some states offer reciprocity. That's what that process is called, reciprocity. Um, they give you one there based on the fact that you have one here. Other states require testing and other states require training and testing. So you want to know that before you go to work somewhere. Okay, good. <clears throat> So yes, OBRA is a national law. It is important and it does impact us, not for testing, but for our future work life. All right. Oh, how many guys, you guys have your yellow books with you, most of you? When I call your name, on the front of your yellow book is the number. I forgot to do this on day one. Um, it, on the front of your yellow book is a number. It starts with a Y. When I call your name, can you tell me what your your number is on the front? Oh, I've got it right on yours. Just tell me I don't have a number. I don't. You don't have a number. Okay. Remind me. Jillian? Shaylin? Hello. Tara? Five. Bernice? Eight. Diana? I'm not here. Uh, Patricia? Oh, that's right. Thank you. Stephanie? Three. Melanie? Seven. Jessica? Eight. Oh, another eight. Okay. Cynthia? JC? I also have seven. Okay, another seven. Okay. Uh, Rachel? Nine. Okay. Amber? You. This is just how I keep track of who has what book. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. So let's review what we learned last week because there has been a weekend in there. Let's see how much you remember. Good morning. That's okay. So how do we know uh, how do we know what to do with each patient? 
the care plan and we follow the care plan the whole care plan and nothing but the care plan you know that last part the part that i make you say you know there's reason why i make you say that line because that's the number one thing that cnas do they try to change the care plan and it's uh, very common for a CNA to try to get a patient out of bed. They're a little unsteady, so they go and grab a walker. Well, that doesn't address the reason why the patient is all of a sudden unsteady. That's a change in the patient. If you're just going to go grab a walker, that's not dealing with the problem at mm -hmm. hand, right? So CNAs are known for trying to change the care plan without realizing that's what you're doing, but you're changing the care plan. That's why I make you recite that, nothing but the care plan, um, because that's where you really get into trouble. And the test questions on the state exam, that's the area that you're probably gonna have the biggest challenge with. Okay. Remember, if you're caught between two answers, think to yourself, I follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and, and that will probably lead you to the right answer. It probably will. Um, I've had students come back to me all the time and tell me, oh my gosh, I heard you in my brain when I was answering those questions. Um, everything that I say is very relevant to the state exam. Uh, what are we gonna observe for? Yeah, changes, pain, abnormalities, anything that sticks out, anything that was different from before, anything. Um, and then who do we report those observations to? The nurse. The nurse, absolutely. Absolutely. So every skill starts with an opening. We're going to do it the same way each and every time. But what does every opening start with? That is important. It is a testing checkpoint on every single skill. So if you just walk right in and don't knock, you're not going to get a check mark. And there's three things on that line. So even if you do two of them, you don't get the check mark unless you do all three. All right. So what are we going to do to the patient? Yeah, we're going to address them by name. We're going to identify them. I mean, who are you? You can ask their name. That's okay. We're not going to have ID bands for the state exam, remember. You can ask them what's your name, or you can just address them by name, Mr. or Mrs. Jones. For the test, we just use one name. So once we know who our patient is, what do they need to know about us? Who we are, who we are. yeah. Not just who we are, what we are. Name and title. Absolutely. Once we get all of the niceties out of the way, we know who they are, they know who we are, all those nice things. What are we going to explain to them? We'll yeah, what we're about to do to their body. Remember, patients own their own body, right? If you come to put your hands on me, I better know what you've got planned. Because I'm probably going to block. <laughs> and if blocking isn't successful, I'm going to ratchet that up a step. <laughs> and I'm going to start hitting. <laughs> so this is very, very common with CNAs. And I wish I had a nickel for every CNA I've heard say, oh my gosh, she tried to hit me. So my first question is always, always, when we have a combative patient, always, did the patient know what you were doing? Did the patient know what you were doing? Well, they should, no, no, they shouldn't. That's not their job, it's your job. So when you're going to do something on the patient, it is vital that you don't just go through the motions that I'm going to do hand and nail care. You got to make sure that they get it. And that means you might have to describe it a couple of times. You might even have to play some charades. If there's a language barrier, you may have to um, do this in stages so you're, especially with dementia patients. So the patient becomes comfortable with what you're doing. But if your patient is combative, 
chances are they don't understand what you're doing. Now, that's even more important if you're going to be anywhere near, near their danger zone. If you're going to be anywhere personal and they don't know what you've got planned, they are going to assume the worst. And if you think I was combative before, now my life is on the line. We have to understand that sometimes in our mindset, we think I'm just here to help you. I'm here to get you cleaned up. And we're looking at it from inside us. We have to take a step out of that and remember what this experience is gonna be like for that patient, especially if they have dementia. Imagine for a second, you are dropped into a strange country where you don't know the language, you know nobody there, they're all strangers, you're in a place you don't recognize, there's no family or friends anywhere, and they're taking your clothes off. How would you react? You can't understand what they're saying. You don't know what they have planned. You don't recognize the place. You're going to be panicked. Guys, that is the daily experience of your dementia patients. They are in an unfamiliar place surrounded by strangers and they don't know the language. It is scary. So we need to slow down and understand where they're at and meet them where they are. Does that make sense? Yeah. So describing the skill, I know it's just one line here, right? Two words, describe skill. And we kind of gloss over that. We have to back up and, and remember that this is probably the most important step on this whole list. Because without it, you're going to be fighting the patient. So you got to describe it in a way they can understand. And then we want to get permission. Now, I will tell you, for the test, you're going to get permission. You're going to ask, is that okay? And the actor, remember, they're pleasant, cooperative in themselves, right? So they're going to say, yes, of course, that's fine. They have a script. When you're working with dementia patients, you do not want to ask, is that okay? Because every dementia patient remembers one word in their vocabulary. No. <laughs> remember, their experience is they are in a strange place, surrounded by strange people speaking an unfamiliar language. They are scared out of their minds. Right, their default position is always going to be no. no. It's also the only word that can exhibit power when you feel powerless. This is why toddlers use this word all the time because toddlers feel powerless, and that word no actually holds power, and kids know because they're told that from the time they're about six months old. No, 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 no. They learn that word holds power. So when they start talking, what do you think they're gonna use? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this also extends to our dementia patients. So I don't ask dementia patients, is that okay? I give them a different choice. Do you wanna do hand meal care now or after lunch? Yeah, so we give them a choice of two, but it's a controlled choice. And no is not one of the options. <laughs> so if they if they say no, now they can still say no, right? I didn't like take it off the table. I'm just not giving it to them as a choice. If they say no, well, then I've got to figure out something else to do, right? So that's when you would go to the nurse and say, hey, I'm trying to give Martha her hand and nail care and she just keeps saying no and doesn't want any part of me. I've tried a couple of times now and then let that nurse figure out what's going on. Okay, good. So we're gonna describe the skill and we're gonna obtain permission. After we get permission, so we gotta go through all that. Not, 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 hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty or CNA today. I'm here to whatever, is that okay? After we get all of that done, then we're going to close the curtain. Do not close the curtain early. And a lot of people do this. They'll walk in the room. The first thing they do is close that curtain before they ever talk to the patient. When you do that, you are sending a not so subtle signal that we don't care if you say no. You're taking their choice away. And that's not really the feeling we want to leave these patients with. 
So we want to go, everything is out in the open. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. You're CNA today. I'm here to whatever. Is that okay? Now I'm going to close privacy curtain once I have consent. There is a power dynamic there, guys. And it may not be visible at first, but you are standing fully clothed. Your patient is lying there in a gown. There is a huge power dynamic here. I'm coming out on top. So when I don't, when I close that curtain and I don't give my patient many options, that can breed resentment in your patients. We want to have a good patient experience, not one of, of unequal power. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, once we've closed that curtain, what do we want to do then? Okay, why do we want to wash our hands before we get our supplies? Okay, yeah, the curtain's dirty, hands are dirty now. We don't want to touch the supplies with dirty hands. So washing your hands um, immediately after you close the curtain before you get your supplies is the right order to get that done. Good? So everybody remember the opening? Yeah. All right, because so we're going to use it again today. So... How do we know when we're supposed to wear gloves? Shouldn't we just wear gloves for everything? No. No? Why? No. Okay, it's not always necessary. And when you wear gloves routinely, you stop paying attention to what those gloves touch. And then you end up contaminating everything because we're not paying attention. So when should we wear gloves? Body fluids. Yes. Personal skin and non-intact skin. So if the answer is yes to any of those, you need gloves. If the answer is maybe to any of those, you need gloves, like foot care. Whole reason I'm doing foot care is to look at the bottom of the feet to see if there's any of the above, because I don't know if there's any there. That's a maybe, so should I need, should I wear gloves? Yes. Yes. Yeah, aside from the fact that it's feet, right? <laughs> Nobody wants to touch somebody else's feet, but it follows our rules. That's what's more important here. When you've decided to wear gloves, when we go through our checklist and we come up with a yes or a maybe, and we're going to wear some gloves, what are the first thing that those gloves should touch? The patient. The patient. What about your supplies? No, no. Yeah. Okay. So you want to gather your supplies and get everything prepped so that when you're immediately ready to start the skill, you're going to put your gloves on, right? After the skill is over, we have to look around and pay attention to what we're touching with those gloves to prevent cross-contamination as well. And then at the end of wearing the gloves, we have to remove them correctly. Skin can touch. What can skin touch? Skin. Can skin touch dirty glove? Okay, so that's going to dictate how we take those gloves off. Skin can touch skin, but it cannot touch the the outside of the dirty glove. Good. All right. So if we're going to use supplies, we have to have a place to put them. So we're going to use a barrier. barrier. Anything can be a barrier. Remember that. For the test, we're going to use a very specific kind of barrier called a disposable under pad. What else do we call it? Chuck. Yeah, let's we're just going to keep it at chucks. It's a whole lot easier. Um, so we're going to use a chucks. Which side faces up? The absorbent side or the plastic side? Absorbent. absorbent side faces up. Are we going to get it at the same time we get all the rest of our supplies? No. When do we get it? Before. Beforehand. It's the first action we take after hand washing. Go get your chucks, put it on your table. Then go get the rest of your supplies. Don't do it all together because you'll end up holding supplies against your uniform and that's going to contaminate the supplies. Okay. Good. Oops. Anytime our patient is exposed or uncovered or undressed, we're going to use one of these guys. Privacy blanket is also called a bath blanket to name same item. We do this in healthcare all the time. Bath basin is a wash basin. Privacy blanket is a bath blanket. Disposable under pad is a chucks. 
a gown is called a Johnny. I don't under I don't know why. I, I know the history of most of them. I don't know why on that that blue, but it's called a Johnny. Um so yeah, we use multiple names. I know it's crazy. Um but when when we're going to use a privacy blanket, so when the patient is uncovered, undressed, exposed in some way, and we're going to use a privacy blanket, how does it go on? How does it go on? On top of the sheet. And then what do we do with the sheet? Pull it down underneath. Now, I've noticed some of my students lately are just putting the privacy blanket on over the sheet, not pulling it down at all. Guys, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. We want the sheet out of the way. If they're going to stay covered with the sheet, you don't need a privacy blanket. Okay, so remember that the blanket goes on, the sheet gets pulled down. And then um, when we're putting the blanket on, what do we have to be careful not to do? Not to shake it. Yeah, don't snap it, don't shake it. And then at the end of the still, we're going to remove it. But you have to think about this this blanket for a second. When we remove it, what do we have to pull up at the same time? The sheet. So that sheet is going to go up right next to the patient's face. Do you want to touch that sheet with dirty gloves? No. So what do you need to do before you remove the privacy blanket? Remove your gloves. Yeah, actually, we don't. We're not. We for the test, we don't have to wash our hands as soon as we remove the blanket. Because it's patient cooties, their cooties, we're okay. It's when we leave the patient environment that we have to wash our hands. Okay, so very good observation. I do want you to wash your hands, but for the test, we can actually put that off until the very end during our closing. However, you're not penalized for washing your hands more than the bare minimum. So if you want to go wash your hands to buy yourself a few minutes to think about your next step, you can. Yes, you can stall legitimately. <laughs> All right, basin cleaning is pretty easy. We rinse it, we dry it, we store it. That's it. That's all we're doing for the test. But we're doing it in such a way that if we have to disinfect the basin, we can use in this process. So we're going to dump the, the content of the basin in whatever receptacle it would normally go in. So if we're dealing with water, that goes in the sink. If we're dealing with uh, body fluids, uh, like urine or feces, that would go in the, really? yeah. Um, emesis, which is another word for vomit, that would go in the oh. toilet, right? Is it good, make sense? Saliva goes in the tank, that's where you brush your teeth. So where it would normally go, just dump it wherever it goes. And then we're going to rinse that basin out. If there's any big globs stuck in there, take your, you know, glove hand and kind of get the glove, like you do your sink at home, just rinse the globs out, right? And then after we've rinsed, we're going to set that basin down because if we have to spray it, that's when we would spray it. Remember, you can't hold something and disinfect it at the same time, right? Make sense? Then we're going to pick it up with a paper towel because we're assuming it was sprayed. It's not going to be for the test, but we're going to pick it up with a paper towel. We're going to dry the inside with a paper towel. We're going to dry the outside with a different paper towel. And we're going to get one to open the drawer to put our stuff away. Good. That's basic cleaning. And then we have the final principle that we learned last week, the closing. So there are six C's to the closing. The first four, the order does not matter. Can anybody tell me one of those four? Curtain? Curtain. Okay, we're going to open the curtain. Clean environment. Call light. And comfortable. Very good. Very good. So we got to have those four things. Once we've done that, then we can... Um, go clean our hands, chart if necessary, and clean our hands again. Good? Make sense? A couple of things, though. You do want to make sure that the patient is covered at the end of the skill to make sure the sheet is on them or they're completely dressed, one or the other. Um, but they do need to be covered at the end of the skill. And the bed needs to be in the lowest position at the end of the skill. 
Now you'll notice when I'm doing these skills, I don't raise the bed up to a comfortable working height for any skill I demonstrate. Now, two reasons for that. Number one, I'm short. It works for me. I don't have to bend far. Most of the population is taller than me, so you're going to have to bend a little bit more. Um, but you're not required to raise the bed to a comfortable working height for any skill. It's not required. You can if you want to, but it's not required. What is required is that the bed is in the lowest position before you end the skill. Now, a lot of people think, well, that's so the patient doesn't roll out of bed. And that's actually not what this is about. It is a fall risk, but it's not from patients rolling out of bed. How many of you guys sleep in a bed? How long have you been sleeping in that bed? Yeah. So you started out in a crib, right? And then once you got big enough that you started climbing, did that crib really keep you safe anymore? No, it actually provided more of an obstacle because now you're falling from a higher height and you've got to go up, over, and then down. So chances of injury were probably pretty high. So once child starts climbing out of the crib, what does mom do? Yeah, we, we use a toddler bed. We lower it. That's right. We're going to take the obstacle away because clearly it's not going to have the desired effect. Now we have to teach the child how to sleep in a bed. This happens about 18 months, 18 to 24 months. During that time, when we transition into a toddler bed, mom probably put something soft on the floor in case you roll out, if she likes you anyway, right? <laughs> and if, um, and that, that child learns how to sleep in the space that they have available to them. This is called spatial awareness. And you do a pretty good job learning this because now you can sleep in a bed without side rails, can't you? Yeah. And you probably can nap on the couch, which is a small space without side rails, right? And you probably can even go to friends' houses and hotels and unfamiliar beds and not fall out. Yeah. Now, we're not going to talk about alcohol because that does affect <laughs> things, right? But generally speaking, you can sleep in a space, familiar or not, big or small, you're able to keep yourself safe within that space, even when you're dead asleep. Good job. Having the bed low does not prevent the patient from rolling out of it. The patient's not going to roll out of it. That's not an issue. You don't roll out. They're not going to roll out. That's not an issue. What is an issue, the reason it's a fall risk, is because when you sit down on the edge of that bed, you swing your legs over at night and you go to sleep and you are dead to the world. When you wake up the next morning, you are groggy. You are not awake. You swing your legs out and that floor is always exactly where you left it. It has never moved a day in your life. It's predictable. You swing your legs out, floor is right where you left it. When we raise the bed up, what do we do? We move the floor. Is that patient going to expect that? No. Because every night of their life, that floor is right where they right. left it. When you raise this bed up and you don't lower it to a comfortable working height, the reason that that is an automatic fail is because the patient isn't going to expect it and then they will fall. It's not about rolling out of bed. It's about the fact that they expect the floor to be in a certain place and you move it. So at the end of the skill, the bed needs to be in the lowest position. Good. We're going to have a whole lesson on side rails a little bit later. This week, I think. Maybe next week. All right. So today we are going to learn hand and nail care, which is one of the skills I was talking about earlier. So if you turn in your books to page 82, while you're getting that set up, let me take a look to see who's here. Good morning, Allison. Good morning, Helen. Thank you, Bailey. I'll write that down. Uh, Pablo wants to know, what do y'all recommend I do before taking my state exam? Okay, right. study would be good. What do you guys recommend? Practice. Practice would be good. 
flashcards would be helpful. How about just tuning in and watching what I say? Yeah, yeah you're in the right place, Mama. Nice question. Yeah. The review videos are The review videos are helpful. The online course. Anybody get into the online course at all? Yes. Very helpful. Very helpful. Uh, let's see here. Gianna, thank you for your scores, Gianna and Bailey. Uh, hi, Thelma from Lubbock, Texas. Welcome. And Rhoda from Nigeria. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. Here, I can remember the scores. <laughs> okay, Jillian, yeah, do, uh, do you have your scores for chapters two and three? Oh, no, you told me yeah. you didn't. Okay, I All can right. send them to your email. Right now. That, that just um, remind me on Wednesday. Yeah. Anytime I have a gap, I'm going to ask you a couple times because it's Monday and I'm tired. <laughs> All right, so page 82 is on hand and nail care. How do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. The care plan. So this care plan tells us provide hand and nail care to one hand. What? Well, let's stop there. What if the patient has two? Follow the care plan. Yeah, follow the care plan. Now, does this care plan say right or left? No. So you get to pick. Pick one. Just do hand and nail care on one hand. The test is not going to specify. Um, that's because you guys are going to be patients for the test. You might have a big old cat scratch on one of your hands, and that gives the evaluators the latitude to say, if you've got a cat scratch on your right hand, to tell her you're going to be doing a left hand, right? So during the test, it allows the evaluators to assign a hand based on what we have going on. In a clinical setting, if we're only doing hand and nail care on one hand, there's a reason. Because most people have two, right? So most care plans are gonna be hand and nail care on both hands. If in a clinical setting, we're only doing one, there's a reason it will indicate which hand we're doing. Good? Okay. People mess this up all the time. You won't because it wouldn't dawn on you, right? Care plan says one hand, you're going to do one, one hand. hand, right? It, it, it's not going to dawn on you to do anything other than what the care plan says. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people during the test think, oh, I'm just going to do both hands for extra credit. Is there extra credit? No. In fact, because they deviated from the care plan, what do you think that's going to do to their score? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there is no extra credit on the test. We don't go above and beyond. We follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and? Care plan. Ah, there it is, all right. Uh, it says the patient is sitting in a chair at the bedside and can move as directed. Woohoo! This is an able-bodied patient. You can ask them, put your hand in the basin, and they will. Take your hand out of the basin, and they will. It's awesome, right? This is not a 90-year-old invalid. Guys, this is a mini Manny. We're going to wash the hand. We're going to rinse the hand. We're going to dry the hand. We're going to clean under it with an orange stick, and we're going to file the rough edges with an emery board. We'll put a little lotion on and wipe off the excess, and then we're going to clean up. The whole reason that we're doing this skill is not really to clean the hand. The reason we're doing this skill is because CNAs cannot use nail clippers. Those are advanced pieces of medical machinery you are not allowed to touch. I know you got them at your house, but we don't use them on patients. If we do hand and nail care once a week and we file the nails on a regular basis, you never have to cut them. And when we cut nails, chances are, if you're cutting them on yourself, you're gonna be super careful. If you're cutting them on somebody else, it's really easy to get the skin on the end. And we're gonna learn a little bit later in the program why that might be dangerous, especially with diabetics. So we don't use nail trimmers. If we file the edges routinely, there's no problem. They don't grow 
long enough to need to be cut. Make sense? Good. We're also going to clean under those nails with an orange stick because two, right? If this patient isn't going to the sink and washing their hands on their own on a regular basis, it's going to have to be done by us. So we would want to clean under those nails. Good? Make sense? This is not a hard skill. Not a hard skill, but we do need to learn some rules about washing. So if you turn in your books, page 80, I happen to have a lesson on it. Now, I really struggled with this, guys. I really struggled with this. If you look up here, I have a video for this, Washing Basics. Now, I normally don't show these videos, these animated videos in class. The only one that I show is the care plan and the CNA on the very first day. The rest of it, I kind of lecture. And on the very last day, I'm gonna show you one on um, continuing education. So how to keep your certification once you get it, right? Mm -hmm. So I show one on the first day, one on the last day, the rest of the time I just talk. But this is probably the best animated video for you to watch because we have lots of washing skills. We have hand and nail care. We have foot care. We have partial bed bath. We have carry care. And we have catheter care. So out of the 20 skills we're going to learn, five of them are washing. So these rules are going to show up over and over and over and over. I'm not going to show you this video in class, but I, I really kind of struggle with this. I was like, no, I really should show it. No, I'm going to talk about it. But I really would strongly recommend that you go back and watch this video sometime over the next week. Okay, it is available for you on our, our main website. It's in the course as well. It's everywhere. It's on YouTube. But we do have a washing rules video. Now, I'm going to go over some of the content in that video now as we're talking. But it's a good video to kind of put all the pieces together. So this is the principle we're going to learn. Remember, if you're looking at the back wall, we already know skill rules. We already know the opening, barrier, glove rules, privacy blanket. We've touched on linen rules because we don't hold stuff up against our uniform. We've learned basin cleaning and shoe rules. So out of the back 11, we already know seven. Pretty good, considering you're only one week in. Now we're going to add washing rules. We're also going to learn the rest of linen rules today as well. So we're going to take this one at a time because, like I said, five of our skills are washing skills. So we got to learn this pretty good. So we're going to take each one of these points one at a time and explain them. So at the beginning of the skill, we've done our opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to whatever. Is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands, right? We then went and got our barrier. Because remember the barrier's first thing that we got. And then we went and got all of our supplies. We'll talk about supplies in a few minutes. We got all of our supplies. We put that out on the barrier. So see all that? We're set up. We're ready to go. And now I got this basin in my hand and I've got to fill it with water. So I've done my opening, I've washed my hands, I've gathered clean supplies with clean hands, I'm holding a clean basin and I'm on my way over to the sink. Now this is where CNAs often forget about infection control because that sink is not clean, but your hands are. So can you touch that faucet with your bare hands to get water. See, this is where it gets confusing because when you go to wash your hands, you touch the faucet with your bare hands and that's okay because dirty hands, dirty faucet, no problem. But when you're getting water, we have to remember our hands are clean. Does that make sense? So we have to have a paper towel to get water for patient use. Now, a lot of students, in order to make this simple, they just use a paper towel anytime they touch a faucet, and that's okay to do. You can do that. It's not necessary, 
but you can't. I'd rather you learn infection control, but if you're really having a hard time with it and you want to use the paper towel for everything, it's okay for the test. All right, so we're going to use a paper towel to turn the water on and off. Once we have the water running, we're going to test it with the inside of our wrist, the inside of our wrist, not the outside, the inside. The skin is thinner here and our nerves are closer to the surface. So it's easier for us to actually gauge the water temperature. So I'm gonna get a paper towel, turn my faucet on so that it's warm. I'm gonna put my wrist on the water, the inside of my wrist and feel it. It should feel warm, not hot, not cold, just warm. So we're looking for that Goldilocks temperature. Okay, good. All right, we don't add soap to the water in the basin. No soap zone. No soap. Now, the reason for this is because we have to wash and rinse and dry. If you add soap to the basin, how are you going to rinse? That's going to be a problem, right? Well, why is that important? Imagine if you got out of the shower all soapy. How uncomfortable would that be? Pretty irritating to the skin. And in fact, what soap does to the skin is dries it out. This is what the skin would look like under a microscope if you're not rinsing the soap off. It actually dries the surface of the skin and makes it crack. Well, cracking would be an opening, a portal of entry. So what does that increase our risk of? Infection. That's right. So let me go back a, a slide here. So whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Now that's kind of second nature to us, right? You would never jump out of the shower all soapy with shampoo in your hair. It just wouldn't happen. You're gonna rinse off before you get out of the shower, but you do it without thinking. Unfortunately, when you're working on patients, it's really easy to skip rinsing. It's way easier than you think it is. In fact, at least two of you in here will skip rinsing, statistically speaking, because you, you get kind of into your skill, right? And now you're paying attention to you, not the patient. patient. So I want you to remember this saying, and I want you to say it to yourself as you're doing the skill, whatever I wash, I rinse. And that'll clue you in to where you are in the step. Wherever I, whatever I rinse, I dry. dry. And that keeps you on track. This sounds very, very simple. I have had countless students that came back and told me that this one statement right here saved them on the test because they forgot to rinse and they went back and did it because they thought about this, okay? It's, it's way easier than you think it is to get wrapped up in your own brain during the test. So good? Good. All right. Let's talk about the skin though. Your skin changes during aging. Have you ever looked at an old person? an old person's arm, mm -hmm. right? I'm gonna be able to use myself here very shortly. <laughs> so if you look at an older person's arm, usually you can see the veins like underneath the skin, like they're really prominent. They look like little ropes or worms under the skin, right? And they tend to like bruise really easy. Just the slightest little bump is gonna bruise them. Well, we don't see your veins under your skin very well. They're not like big, thick, ropey things. And you don't bruise all that easily. So what changed? Well, the change is age. So we have to understand that the skin changes significantly with aging. Some of you are gonna go, oh, that's why, in just a second, <laughs> okay? So when we're young, we got nice thick layers. You got a layer of skin, you got a layer of fat, you got a layer of muscle, and they're nice and cushiony and thick, and they protect everything underneath from injury. 
you're in good shape. When we get into middle age, those layers start to decrease a little bit. And that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm starting to lose some of my layers. And if you notice here, this layer of fat, pretty thick, and that's protecting underlying structures. This layer is a little bit thinner. As we go into elderly age, look how thin that layer is. So it's not protecting the underlying structures very well. Our layer of subcutaneous fat, especially in our extremities, tends to go away as we age. It breaks down. So we end up literally with skin over blood vessels, over muscle. So this is why bruising can happen and things like this in skin tears, because the skin, the layer of skin, look how thick that skin layer is up there. Look how thin it is down here. It doesn't take much to tear that. It's like tissue paper because it's so thin. So this is normal aging process. Well, why do we care? Because that layer of fat does several very important things. That layer of fat actually acts as a wetsuit. So anybody know what normal body temperature is? Yeah, 98.6, but it's a range. 97.6 to 99.6 considered normal. But let's just take on 98.6 for make it easy. What's your temperature, roughly? Okay, 72, 78, 70. Let's just make easy numbers. Let's go 75, right? All right, so let's say that you've got a pint of ice cream in the freezer and you take it out of the freezer and leave it on the counter for half an hour. What happens to the ice cream? Melts. Melt. You take a cherry pie out of the oven and it's 325 degrees and you leave it on the counter. What happens to cherry pie? It cools down, right? So room temperature always wins. Does that make sense? Room temperature always wins. Room temperature is going to heat up cold things, cool down warm things. Room temperature always wins. That's important. Because our body temperature has to be 98.6. What did I just tell you about room temperature? Oh, and room temperature is about 75 degrees, which means that this room right now is trying to cool your body down below 98.6 degrees. Room temperature always wins, unless there's an outside force, or in this case, an inside one. Your body has to work hard to maintain that temperature of 98.6 degrees because the room is trying to cool you down. And if, your room, if the room temperature wins and you get down to below 94 degrees, you will die. It's not much room for error there, guys. 98.6, if you're colder than 94, you're dying. What's room temperature trying to do? Cool you down. So that means that your body has to take the food that you eat and burn it to create heat to keep your body temperature at 98.6. That's a lot of work. That is a lot of work that your body has to do. Now, when you're young and you got this nice wetsuit on, that's holding in a whole lot of that body heat. So your body doesn't have to work so hard to maintain that temperature. What do you think is going to happen when that wetsuit goes away? Yeah, the room temperature is going to win a whole lot more, isn't it? The body's going to have to work a whole lot harder because that body heat's radiating away. So now calories that should have gone to nutrition is going to just keeping the body alive. So our body systems aren't going to run as effectively. Does that make sense? 
good. But that layer of fat, that wetsuit does something else as well. It doesn't just keep our body heat in where we need it. It keeps outside temperatures from affecting it. So you can sit in this 72 degree room and feel somewhat comfortable, maybe a little cool, but somewhat comfortable. You can step outside in 90 degree heat and feel warm, but not like dying, right? Because that layer of fat helps protect you from temperature outside your body. It helps keeping that 90 degree temperature from raising your temperature. It helps keep the room being cold from lowering your temperature. So that layer of fat does two very important things. It keeps outside temperatures out. It keeps inside temperatures in. It's important. So what do you think is going to happen when we lose it? So body is going to be releasing more heat. It's going to have to work harder. Our calories that we take in are going to be used for just maintaining life rather than nutrition, right? But it's also going to react to outside temperatures. Have you ever heard an older person say, yeah, I can't live up north anymore. I just can't deal with the cold. Mm -hmm. They're not lying. They don't have a wetsuit. That cold that feels cold to you is downright frigid to them. But it's also why you can walk into grandma's house and go, oh, grandma, my gosh, it's 85 degrees in here. <laughs> wow, hot. Well, they don't want to be in a cold environment because remember room temperature always, and that means our body has to work harder to maintain heat. Right, that's why everybody retires to Florida. Because we have weather that's suitable for older people that don't have their wetsuits anymore. Make sense? So when we're in a, in a facility and our patients go, oh my gosh, I'm so cold, I'm so cold. Give me a sweater, give me a blanket. Do not argue with them. They're serious. It is cold to them. You are fully dressed with a wetsuit intact. You are not going to feel temperature the same way they do. Two totally different perceptions. But it's not just room temperature. It's also water temperature. So when I feel that water with the inside of my wrist, and I think, hey, it feels pretty good. That means it feels pretty good to me. Who really needs to be the one checking the water? The patient. That is a graded checkpoint. And if you miss it, it is big. But are there more specified foods? No, not really. Not really. Um, yeah, you know, some people will eat spicier foods, but usually as you age, your tolerance for spice goes down. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not really um, effective for temperature regulation. It's much better to regulate the temperature by um, raising the room temperature. That way their body doesn't have to work so hard. Okay. It's kind of hard to affect, in the aging process anyway, it's kind of hard to affect body heat internally with aging? Good question. So does this make sense? Do you now see why little old grandmas always have sweaters on? Do you understand why this is a graded checkpoint to ask them to test the water every time? Now, the other problem here is that people have different preferences. I like my showers hot enough to remove skin. <laughs> Scalding hot is where I'm at. Right? My husband likes cool showers. He doesn't like scalding hot. So we don't have the same preferences. You guys also don't all have the same preferences. 
So why do we assume that we're the only ones that know what our patients are going to want? Everybody has a little bit different idea. Let me tell you a story about this. I was working in a nursing home and I could hear screams from the shower room. I mean, blood curling screams from the shower room. And I'm thinking somebody fell, something, I, you know, something's going on. So I go into the shower room and I couldn't see. I mean, my glasses fogged up right away. There was steam everywhere. And the patient, little old lady sitting in a shower chair, um, is fighting for, <laughs> she's probably a hundred pounds soaking wet and, and completely naked and wet. And she's fighting for all she's worth. And the CNA is trying to push her under the water spray. And she's got her hands on the walls and hitting and biting and kicking and screaming. And it's like, you know, a whole wrestling match going on in there. I'm like, whoa, stop, wait a second. What is going on here? And she's like, I have to shower this patient and she's not cooperating. She's uncooperative. And we throw that word around, uncooperative. Okay, there's no such thing as an uncooperative patient that's their body that is their body they have the right to determine what's going on with their body there is no uncooperative that means that you have more right over their body than they do i hate that word so i'm like hold up grab the bath blanket put it on the patient so at least she's you know covered not feeling so exposed i'm like turn that water off so the, the CNA goes over and turns the water off. And I looked at the patient and I'm like, are you okay? Are you okay? And she, all she kept saying is hot, 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 hot. And she was being burned by the water and trying to tell the CNA stop. And the CNA wasn't listening. That is all kinds of wrong. Help isn't help if it doesn't help. You are there to help that patient get clean. Help isn't help if it's not helping. And you are not helping her right now. You are doing things the way you want to do. You're all up in your head and you did not make it about the patient. Yeah, so you and I are gonna have a little talk this afternoon about let's put, refocus back on the patient. And sometimes we all get in a rut. We get in our own heads, we start to look at the tasks in front of us, and we have to have a reminder to get our priorities straight. Don't get upset with your nurse if they're trying to refocus you back on the patient. That's on you. You need that. I need that. There are days that I get in my head. I need that, too. But if we don't hold each other accountable, who's gonna who who's going to? Right. So be careful here. Make sure the patient checks the water and make sure they're okay with the water temperature. And if at any time they say, I'm not okay with it, listen to them. It's their body. We're just there to help. Good? Make sense? All right. So we always have the patient check the water. It doesn't matter if they're sitting in a chair for hand and nail care or foot care, whether they're laying in the bed for partial bed bath, carry care, catheter care, or whether we're helping them in a shower or a bathtub. Doesn't matter where the water is. We're going to have them check it. And then if we're taking a long time here, and some of these skills can get a little long, if that water becomes cold, you probably ought to change it. Okay. Good. Okay, a couple other things with washing rolls. You should, no, let me go back here. Find it, where is it? Oh, there's a lot of slides. There we go. All right. <laughs> so we've gone over most of these. Basins are no soap zones. We have to keep our water clean for rinsing. We're gonna use paper towel to turn the faucet on. We're gonna use warm water, not hot, not cold. Check it with the inside of your wrist. We're gonna let the patient check the water temperature too. Uh, skip this one for now. We're gonna go over that a little bit later in the program. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. 
Yeah, we're gonna change that water if it gets cold or soapy. But um, there's two more here I wanna go over. Don't get the surface wet. In this case, our patient sitting in a chair at an overbed table, we're gonna be working on the table. So what do we wanna put on that table to keep her from getting wet? A barrier. a barrier. That's right. If we're working in bed, like getting a bed bath, we've gotta protect the sheet. You can use a barrier, that's fine. Might be more comfortable for the patient if you use a towel. Um, either way is fine. And then if we're gonna put lotion on, we always warm that lotion up in our hands first, and then we put it on the patient and then wipe off the excess because your skin is only gonna absorb so much. Whatever's left that didn't get absorbed is gonna lay on the surface of the skin. So if we're working with hands, right? If I put lotion on one of your hands and you go to pick up a cup of hot coffee with that hand, what's gonna happen? It's going. Yeah, so we always warm the lotion up, rub it in, and then wipe off the excess anywhere on the body. Very important. Good. All right, so these are our um, checklist items for this particular skill. We're going to soak the hand in water. So remember, we're going to do our opening, we're going to get our supplies, we're going to get our water using a barrier to turn the faucet on and off, check the water with the inside of our wrist, we're going to ask our patient, that's all under washing rules, right? All of that is covered here, 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 and here, right? All of those steps. We're going to decide if we need gloves. Now, our patient is you, another testing student, sitting in a chair, you have no stress, there's no marks, no nothing on your hand. You just got skin. I'm nowhere near her personal areas. Guys, if you find yourself in the neighborhood or personal area doing in nail care, you took a wrong turn. <laughs> okay. So I have no body fluids that I'm going to touch. I have no personal skin I'm going to touch. I have no non intact skin I'm going to touch. Do I need gloves? No. No. If she's got a big old cat scratch on that hand, do I need gloves? Yes. It's based on the patient, not on the skill. All right, so we'll evaluate glove, glove rules. So we're going to soak the hand in water, and then we're going to take it out of the water, because remember, basins are no soap zones. So I'm going to get a wet washcloth, wring it out really well, no drippy wet washcloths here. So we're going to wring it out really well, and I'm going to put soap on the washcloth, not in the water. I'll wash all surfaces, and then I can take that hand, put it back in the basin to rinse. We'll take it out to dry. I'm gonna clean under the nails with an orange stick and I'm going to file the rough edges with an emery board. Now, when we use an emery board, we only wanna go in one direction toward the center. Don't go back and forth rapidly across the surface of the nail. Let me show you why. We've got three of them that are doing this right now. As we age, our nails get brittle. They tend to split and peel and crack and do all kinds of things that you young nail people don't do. And curve. Yes, and curve, that's right. So if I take this emery board and I, on my nail, go back and forth really rapidly across the surface of the nail, it's gonna split right up the middle. Because what I'm doing, when I take this emery board and I push that way and pull this way, it's causing longitudinal stress on the center of that nail. And the area of least resistance is going to crack. So we don't do that. We take the emery board and we in one direction toward the center of the nail, this side toward the center of the nail, one direction, and then you can go across the point, not back and forth. You don't want to torque that nail. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. When we're cleaning under the nails with an orange stick, you want to use the scoopy edge. It makes sense. If we're cleaning, you want to use the slanted edge that can scoop the stuff out from under the nails. Oops, there we go. So here's our steps. We're going to soak the hand in, ba in the basin. We're going to wash, rinse, dry. We're going to put the hand on a towel and use the slanted end of the emery board or the orange stick under each nail. Guys, wipe that stick off in between nails because ew, <laughs> right? You don't want to import gross stuff from one nail into another. So wipe it off in between. 
We're going to file the edges with the emery board one direction only. We're going to warm some lotion in our hands, put it on and wipe off the excess. And then we're going to clean up. Let's do a closing after that because we do that for every seal. And that's the whole um, process. So this skill has a lot of principles in it. We're going to use skill rules. We follow the care plan. We're going to do our opening. We're going to get a barrier. We evaluate glove rules. We're going to use washing rules, right? Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. We're going to clean the basin the way we clean everything else. And we're going to do the closing. Guys, half of our, our uh, principles are in this one skill. They're also in a whole lot more. You'll see them over and over. They don't require these actually. Like, I know you say each patient is different. You have to go through that checklist to see if they are actually required to wear gloves. Mm -hmm. But if they don't require uh, to wear gloves, it's your preference. Like, for me, kind of gym clothes with like the dirt and stuff under your nails, could you be penalized for actually wanting to wear gloves? The answer to that is it depends. It really depends on the evaluator. Number one is they don't want you to wear gloves for everything because that shows that you don't have a good grasp on infection control. Um, and that's a little bit concerning for them. The second reason is that supplies are expensive. And the testing, if you're using gloves for everything in the testing center, even skills we don't need gloves for, it costs the testing center money. So some evaluators will actually tell you, you don't need gloves for that. Um, so it really kind of depends on the evaluator that you get. If, and remember, you're doing this in the testing center on another person, another testing person. Chances are they're already going to have clean nails for the test. Um, so if you wear gloves for that, for the test, they may say something. Now, in a clinical setting, if you've got a digger, I'll just leave it there. If you've got a digger and you are cleaning under their nails, then yes, that falls under body fluids. <laughs> yeah, guys, hand and nail care should be done at least once a week, at least. That keeps the nails at a nice level. If you got somebody who cannot get to the sink and physically wash their own hands, you should be doing this minimum of daily. Several times a day would be ideal. Think about all the stuff your hands get into. If you don't wash them, who's going to? Yeah. So we want to make sure that we're keeping our patients' hands clean for a sanitary reason. The other thing is when we learn ambulate with a gate belt later on in the program, your patients are going to, to set their hands right on your shoulders. I don't know about you, but if I've got some patient that's going to put their hands on my shoulders, I'd really prefer that those hands be clean because there's a whole lot of portals of entry right here. Make sense? So we want to do a good job with this and remember that, you know, if your patient can't get to the sink, we're it. We are it. All right. So let me show you this skill. I'm going to show you the video for this one. It's got very good close-ups. And then we're going to take a break. So if somebody looks, oh, darn. Sorry, guys. I don't know if they've been able to hear me. Um, if somebody looks on the bottom of page 82, how much time do they give you to do this skill? How long? How long does it take you to wash your hands? Yeah. Does not take 11 minutes to do this skill. They give you 11 minutes because you're new and you're slow. <laughs> And that's okay. You're supposed to be slow. This is the one time in your life it's legit to be slow. But you don't have to be that slow. So if you look here. They give you 11 minutes. 
I get this whole spiel done in six minutes and 32 seconds. And that includes the whole intro and the credits. So it's about five minutes to do this still. It doesn't take 11. But you've got to practice this. You really do. Um, it's not a hard skill, but you do have to practice. You do not want the first time you do a skill to be full of attempts. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Wonderful. I need to do hand and nail care on one hand. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain for privacy. Let me go wash my hands and then I'll gather my supplies. Okay. Okay, we're going to start with a barrier. So I'll place a barrier on the table and that will give me a place to set your clean supplies. And then I'm going to gather a basin, soap, and lotion. An orange stick and emery board. Two washcloths. And a towel. I'm going to go get some water in the basin. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones, would you like to check the water temperature and make sure it's okay? Pretty good? Yes. Okay, you can submerge your hand in there if you'd like. Okay. And I'll bring that tray a little bit closer to you. Thank you. Is that comfortable? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to place the washcloths in here. And we'll wet one of the washcloths and use it to get your hand wet. Now I'm going to place your hand over here on the towel. Apply soap to the washcloth. And now I'm going to wash all surfaces of your hand including in between the fingers, in this area between the thumb and the forehead. I'm going to turn your hand over now and wash the palm of your hand. Now we're going to place your hand back in the basin to rinse. Okay, I'm going to bring your hand over here to dry. I'm going to dry between the fingers, and I'm going to turn your hand over and dry the palm of the hand as well. Okay. Now we'll take the orange stick, and I'm going to clean under each nail. Just cleaning the edge. Does that hurt? No. We'll wipe the orange stick on a towel in between each finger. And now I'm going to file any rough edges. So I'll file from the outer edge to the middle. Checking each nail for any rough edges. And now we can apply lotion. So I'll get a little lotion, warm it up in my hands, and apply it to all surfaces in the hand. Feel good? Yes. Great. Okay. Now we'll wipe off the lotion. Okay. 
Okay. Great. Wonderful. I'm going to place my soiled linens in the dirty linen container and then clean up my workspace. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, on the way, we'll pick up the soap and the lotion and place them in the basin. We'll use the paper towel to open the drawer and place the basin in. These items will get thrown away. Okay, Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Can I offer you a magazine? No, ma'am. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, thank you. Okay, your call light is right there. Please use it to call me if you have a need. I'm going to open your curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll review the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Um, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. how come we aren't disinfecting the basin though? For the test, it's like your sink at home. Okay. You don't disinfect your sink every time you use it. And this is a single patient use item. Okay. So, if you go to the hospital and you get an admission kit that has a bath basin in it, you're the only one that's going to use it. Right. So, there are some situations where we do, even because it, it, even though it's single patient use, we are going to disinfect it in between uses, right. especially if somebody has a depressed immune system or um, is on uh, chemotherapy, which depresses the immune system, that type of thing, um, or if they have a current infection. So, disinfection would be required. We always go by the care plan. Okay. For the tests, we're simply going to rinse, dry, and store. Good question. Any others? Any others? No? Okay, we got a lot of people joining us from all over. Let's say hello to, I guess my mic's working now. So we're going to say hello to, um, let's see here. Kimberly is watching from Port St. Lucie. Naomi's watching from West Palm Beach, yeah, Delray Beach, West Palm Beach County. Um, Rose is from Boynton Beach, and Isa has a state exam today. Any tips? Yes, follow the care plan. Follow the care plan. Watch us as long as you can. Uh, good luck on your tests. Let us know how you do. We'll give you a shout out on Thursday. If you drop by my channel, let me know that you passed. All right, guys. We're going to go ahead and take a break. Come back in 15. Um, I still need the um what's it called the paper from the review sheet from last week. Okay, because I wasn't here on Thursday. Um, yes, ma'am. I'm also going to need for today, too. I'm going to head out. Because okay. Let me get you to not. I did want to have an episode next week. I'm not going to be here for Monday and Wednesday. You can have off and Okay. So apparently, like whenever I'm trying to do that, they just have to make a certain virus. So it's like, oh no, all of the time that I'm like in class, it's like, well, why would all this equipment go? I'm like, okay, well, that's okay. Well, uh, we'll get to, I mean, at least you can watch live or yeah. replays. Let me get to five and six then. 
yeah, it was just like ironic how everything happened because when I signed up, I was completely okay. And then it's like <laughs> closer to class starting and it's all these problems. I'm like, oh, but at least like I'll get cleared now here too. Yeah. So. You too. Hope you get some rest. Thank Anybody bought those last project? I was thinking about them. Yeah, me too. They're on sale. If anybody has. Do we need an invite to go to her class and take all their things? Did you get that email the one that we did? Mm -hmm. Anyway, well, order. Like, it's an email, like for instance, it's gonna email after class of the day, bring your stuff to code and also bring like the white ball can and then order like you can because she always is like thinking so like, yeah, I don't get any in the early. Mm -hmm. That's why I told her that. And, and um, she's been like wrap up together that you can review again. She sends a lot of emails. And then I told her she's got to do something because I haven't done any. I didn't know if they can just join the class online without being invited. I mean, I'm going to ask her. And then it never logs you out once you've heard it. Every time I want to go back into the course to watch a video or do something, like I'm always watching. Yeah, always I want to keep the videos and the activities. So. Yeah, because like all that puzzle stuff that she does on the screen, you can do that at home cool. as many times as she wants. And that's what I want to do. Yeah, that's what I was working on teaching while I'm at work. Great. <laughs> because I'm already doing home health. Oh, okay. So that's cool. There's a lot of things that are um like so like such as welfare. Um like she was saying she can email to her and I I knew that. But my experience from my patients that I have now it's so mad if I say it's not to you know. Right. And then they'll send me the same because they don't understand that it's out of us. Right. Like, I'm just going to see if I can. I'll ask her after class and it's going to stay and ask her. If I, if I need an invite because I'm missing out on it. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 It's an old email. it's an old email address. I mean, it's pretty ancient. It shows my age. So. What is it? AOL? Bell, bell. Bell, bell. 
One's on docell.net. I mean, I'm 40. Is it going to your junk mail or? I can't find the junk mail. Are you not on the phone? Yeah, I don't. I can't even find spam, but I'm not getting the emails either. I can't find the spam email. Are you worried about the people? She had the PDF that she sent me. I didn't even yeah. get it the right way. It's a PDF file. It's not even the right way. I don't even come out. Yeah, I don't see anything. No, I'm not getting that stuff out. No. I just would feel. But I did finally get into the uh, the course one. Oh, you did? She, yeah, she helped me with that. And so I got into that one. Did you need an invite for it, or you just went in? I got the invite. Right. Yeah, I got finally got that one, but um, still don't get the other the class. I, I just don't think she had an assistant at some point. I just want to do that so we get one. Yeah, I've been doing those. Yeah, but I don't get the email because sometimes I just like to see it and do it from South. Exactly. And that's what I've been doing. I learned better that way. Yeah. Hands on. I'm more of a hands on. Yeah. 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 I learned some of the book, but I'm more hands on. Yeah, so I've been I've been doing that and I've been doing this plus I've been working. Yeah. <laughs> I, well I just I've just left I I do twelve hour shifts. I start uh Friday night at eight PM. I go to 8 a.m. and then you know I do that, so I just got off of I have to switch it and go in at 7 p.m. on Sunday, Sunday nights, and get off at 6 a.m. So you you work? Yeah. Well, you got off at 6. I just got off at 6:30 this morning. Fresh and so you fresh work. So yeah. Wow. I got off at 6:30 this morning. Stopped at a friend's house. He uh, had tea, something to eat, and a shower. Yeah. And then he brought me here, so I'm not driving because I haven't slept. So he well, drives. I worked for 36 <laughs> hours. Yeah. So he got home at like 30. Yeah. Shower. So yeah, I've done with someone else like. <laughs> yeah. So I do Friday, Saturday, and Sunday the 12 hour shift. And then I'm off the rest of the week and so I go back. <laughs> but I'm trying to do this so I can get day shift because my work won't put me on day shift. Really? Do you work for senior helper? I work for senior helper. Yeah. I want to get on day shift. I don't want to be that life anymore. Did you? Well, I worked for them for um, three years, and then I moved to Georgia for a little while, and now I've been back for, for a couple of years. So you guys are used to this stuff. Oh, yeah. But I'm doing it for 2020 and 19. Well, well, I did private family for six years, so I've been doing it for the Yeah, I've been doing it for You're not covered, like, you know. You work for a company to share that that cover for the you know, as far as I was in the Yeah. Working with the uh all all support services they're all in Canada. Oh have like they serve in human challenges. Yeah. They they do have a few clients here in Springville, but not as many as you would break or force. But I, I currently, on the weekend, I currently go to West because like the whole spray out on the street on the way to the street on the street. Right. So I see this. Yeah. Why does it end? Maybe one person. Yeah, it's a, it's like an assisted living place or like an independent mm -hmm. living place out there, but I do private world news. Yeah, for the company. 
That's the down call. Hmm? That's the down call. What? One person. See, they have a, a fine hour for now. They don't have one of those. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. That's all we have. Push the button. Push the button. Yeah, I've never used a push the button on it. It was 98 this morning. It was like, what? Then, he said, then we checked it again. It was 97. Are you kidding me right now? It's huh? It's Samson. This is Black Ripper. 97. Is that a top number? Yeah. Oh. So we're good. They know. <laughs> It's good. It's good for another bit. Yeah. <laughs> I never used it. Side I know it's cute. It's not before I was a panic. I used to have a purple one. It's a... This one, it's so wonderful. This thing is so loud. Can you turn it and turn it off? No. Mine turns off. Here's this one. Really? Can what you turn it and turn it off? The thing? What part? This part? Yeah, the piece. So maybe it doesn't have back for it. Yeah, and if you can turn them off. Tap it, put it in your ear, and you can tap it gently and know if it's on or off. Now turn it. No, no, don't turn that. Turn the whole thing. Which one? Turn the whole page. Oh. Now tap it. Get on back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. That way you don't so much because somebody used to uh go up to you to do a prank, yeah, and they would tap it. Oh yeah, but they would do it as a prank. Yeah. And so now oh, they make okay, it so yes, you can turn off. Yeah. <laughs> It's cold in here. Feels good. My client keeps his house at 80 degrees. Yep. Oh, and, but now you know why. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was, when I learned that, I thought it was interesting because I could actually connect the, the pieces then. But when he goes and takes a shower, not 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 so much now, when, but before he, he would uh, go crank the heat on. Yeah. He's like, oh my God, no. <laughs> A phone charger? Yeah. Or sorry. <laughs> Did I say iPad? Um, I'm both really the for uh, Apple. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do in my car. Uh, yeah, I don't have. I don't think I have an Apple cord in here. This has got to be close by because she's done it here. Oh, okay. What is that? 
Um, I think Jake has one next door, but I'll we'll clean it up after class. Thank you, though. Okay. Be right back. Actually, I'll give you the um the brick and you can plug it in right there underneath that. Oh, yeah, well, you can plug it, sure. So any questions on handing out there? I have a question. Mm -hmm. some, some people use two baits, one for soap and one for the Right. And um, for the test, they're not going to have two basins. They'll only have one. The other thing that you have to think about is that every supply that we use with patients costs the patients money. It's billed to them. So if you ever get a hospital bill, You'll actually see line items, every single thing that was used in your care. And those basins cost about, I don't know, somewhere around $30 yeah. a piece. So it, it's an unnecessary expense for the patient. And we're trying to minimize that as much as possible. Good question, though. All right, so let's go to page 92 and learn about London rules. So this is going to be short and sweet. Again, I do have a video on this you can watch, but I'm just going to make this really quick and easy. Um, we already know the first one. Linens must not touch uniform. We already know that because our uniform is not considered clean. We have to have clean hands to get linens. Well, we learned that during the opening. So nothing new here. Do not uh, shake or snap linens. Well, we learned that with the privacy blanket. Nothing new here. This is new. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. You're going to hear me say that a couple of times in this program. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. And I'm going to explain why in just a second. We don't want anything to touch the floor. I don't care if it's clean or dirty. It doesn't touch the floor. Um, the floor is not considered clean. We walk on it. You know, we walk outside. We walk in bathrooms. We walk on the floor. 
And whatever we pick up along the way, it's gonna be distributed on the floor. So you don't want clean items to touch that floor and then be used on the patient. But you also don't wanna put dirty items on the floor because people walk through that area and we don't wanna track um, infectious items from room to room. So nothing touches the floor, clean or dirty. If it does during the test, you need to acknowledge it. If you're changing the sheet, which is the skill we're about to learn, and the sheet touches the floor, don't ignore it. Don't think the evaluator didn't see it. Don't pretend it's no big deal. You need to address it. You need to say, correction, the sheet touched the floor. I would remove it from the bed and get a new one. You're not going to have to actually remove it from the bed and get a new one, but you do have to address it. Good? Make sense? Anything, I call this the use it or lose it policy. Anything that you take off of clean supply has to be used or discarded. Use it or lose it. We cannot keep patient use items in a room for later use because once they're out of your sight, how do you know for sure they're clean? You don't. And we can't put things back on the clean supply shelf because once you take it into a patient's room, it's, yeah, contaminated. So use it or lose it. This is probably gonna show up on the written test. There's usually one question about you took too many washcloths when giving a partial bed bath. What do you do with the remainder of the items? Put them in dirty money. That's your only option. Okay. Good. Questions? So a lot of rules pretty pretty easy. But let me explain to you the clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away thing. Oh, good morning, Dawn. Okay. So when we're changing sheets, let's say we have a dirty sheet and we have a patient laying on that dirty sheet. Good? Okay. The patient is what made this sheet dirty. Fair enough, right? The patient is still in the bed. So the dirty thing is still in the bed. So when we're changing sheets with the patient in the bed, we have to remember the dirty thing is still in the bed. And as soon as that dirty thing touches the clean sheets, the clean sheets are technically going to be dirty. Good? Make sense? So this skill is not about trying to maintain a strict infection control anything because the dirty thing is still in the bed. But there's a way to do this to help minimize direct cross-contamination. And the way we remember that is clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. So this is a dirty sheet. If I roll it away, the underside of the sheet is what's facing up. Got it? Now, if the sheet is wet, soiled, I could wrap a towel or a chucks around that roll. So now I'm not contaminated. Good? Now, clean, the new clean sheet rolls toward me. So the underside of the sheet is what's facing up. So the underside of this sheet goes under the underside of that sheet. No direct pathogen transfer. But it really doesn't matter a whole lot because the dirty thing is still in the bed. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you leave the pillowcase on the pillow while you're changing the bottom sheet. Patient's dirty. Don't worry about pillow. And yes, the dirty pillowcase is touching the clean sheet, but still with the patient. Good? Make sense? So what we're going to do when we're changing sheets with a patient in the bed is change them a half at a time. So if we have a patient laying in bed, I'm going to roll the dirty sheet toward the patient, tuck it up under their hips, roll the clean sheet toward me, tuck it up underneath the dirty, 
and the patient's going to be laying on top. I'm going to go around to the other side of the bed. I'm going to roll them over, take that dirty sheet out of the way, and anything removed from the bed, we want to ball up. And I'm going to spread that clean sheet out. And I now made a bed with somebody in it. Good. Questions? Anytime you can make a bed without somebody in it, that's way better. We like that way better. So if you have a patient that is out at activities or in therapy or doing a test or shower room or wherever, if there's an empty bed, your brain should automatically go, wait, does that, do those sheets need to be changed? <laughs> because it takes me about two minutes to change a bed with nobody in it. It takes me about seven minutes to change a bed with somebody in it. So if the bed is empty, that's the best time to change the sheets. But sometimes we're in a situation where we don't really have a choice. We have to change the sheets with the patient still in the bed. And that's what this skill is going to show. Okay, good. Again, you're gonna evaluate every skill based on the patient you're doing the skill on. So. If you look on page 100, and you look at the bottom of the screen or bottom of the um, page, who are we doing this skill on? Okay, when you guys go to tests, are you planning on wearing clothes? Yes. Maybe. Yeah. So you're going to be fully dressed. You're going to be holding on to all of your body fluids like a champ. So if you're changing the sheets and the patient is fully dressed and controlling all of their body fluids, do you need gloves? No. So for the test, the patient that you're working on, fully dressed. No body fluids, don't need gloves. Can wear them if you want to. Still a whole lot easier without them. Take the gift they give you guys. In a clinical setting, I know that patients in bed scratch what itches. And those areas probably have touched the sheets. So chances are in a clinical setting, if I'm working on a patient that just has a gown on and not much else, I'm going to wear gloves because I know the dangly bits have touched the sheets. <laughs> That's a private area. So our private parts will, personal skin will qualifies. Good? I know I have a way of describing this stuff that you won't ever forget. All right, so a couple, uh, couple of things I wanna point out for this particular skill. When you're looking at this, and the, this is the my activity book here. So this thing, remember this? Yes. Right, so if you look back here somewhere, somewhere, it's all out of order right now, but somewhere in here is making, oh, there it is, making an octopi bed, right? So everything that you see on the screen, you can see right here. You guys can play with this if you want to, but I want to show you something else. If you look along the side here, you'll see all the principles that we're going to do with this particular skill. So we're going to read the care plan because we do for every skill. You'll notice that this is on every skill. So is the opening because we do that for every skill. So is blood rules because we evaluate that for every skill. And we're usually using a barrier. Right, so pretty much the first four are kind of a gimme. We always do the closing at the end too. So when you're looking at this, um, kind of the, the first four and the last one is, you kind of know we're gonna go. So the ones in the middle are what's gonna change. For this particular skill, we're gonna use privacy blanket because we're changing the sheets. That means the patient is uncovered. We don't want to bear patient exposed. So we're going to use privacy blanket. Linen rolls are going to apply because cleaning rolls or knee dirty rolls away. We don't want anything to touch the floor. Um, you want to make sure that you don't hold the linens against your uniform and you ball them up before you throw them in dirty linen. Good? 
Student role is a new one. We're going to get into this in a little bit more um, detail next class. But just remember the patient always needs to be in the middle of the bed. That makes sense. Um, and then we're going to get into our, our task specific. So these are all pretty self explained we, We've gone over them. You know the rules. You know the principles involved. You know these. What we now have to focus on is this, skill specific. So what about occupied bed isn't covered in these checkpoints, but is still covered on the test? That's what this is. Good? Questions? Well, we don't want the patient lying on a bare mattress. Well, that just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You wouldn't want to lay on a bare mattress yourself. It would feel kind of cold hard plastic, a little icky because who else is laid on this mattress, right? We, we want to avoid that. So we always have to make sure the patient is positioned on a sheet at all times. That's important because some people, when they're doing this still, they'll take the whole bottom sheet off the bed, leave the patient on the mattress, and then put a whole new sheet on the bed. That's not how this should be done. That's why we use the whole clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. So we're changing the sheets at the same time. So we're gonna replace the sheet on one side of the bed at a time. So make the bed a half at a time to the bottom. Um, we're gonna remove the bottom dirty sheet and secure the clean sheet on the mattress with corners. Guys, the best invention since sliced bread <laughs> is a fitted sheet because it used to be on, on everything was a flat sheet. So you put this flat sheet on the mattress and you have to tuck it and tie it in a way to make it stay. And talk about a nightmare. When I first learned nursing, we were still using flat sheets on the bottom. And within a couple of hours, they would just be a whole big rumpled mess and the patient be laying on the bare mattress. So the best invention, as far as I'm concerned, is fitted sheets and it helps you so much with the skill and makes it easy. We want to smooth any wrinkles. Wrinkles lead to bed sores. We'll talk about that in another lesson. Wrinkles lead to bed sores. So we want to try to minimize wrinkles wherever possible. Guys, you're never going to get this perfect. You can't. There's a body in the bed. Wrinkles are automatically going to be part of the equation. But what we don't want is a bird's nest. We want the sheet as stretched and, and uh, taut as we can. Um, we'll replace the top sheet. We are going to have to make hospital corners. It's not as hard as you think. Um, we'll loosen the sheet over the toes because you don't want that sheet to bend the toes down. And um, we're not going to tuck along the sides of the bed. Remember, patients have freedom of movement. If you tuck the sheet all along the side of the bed on both sides, you've mummified that patient and it can cause injury when they're trying to get out. It's, it's a restraint. And sadly, some people use that technique to restrain patients. That's never allowed. So don't tuck the sheets along the side. Don't mummy the patient in. Now, if there's nobody in the bed, if it's an empty bed, like that one over there, we'll tuck those sheets all along the side of the mattress. And what that does is it keeps critters from climbing into bed with our patients. Now, this is a very, 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 very old technique. Way back when, like World War II. Back then, we didn't have air conditioning in most hospitals. Hospitals were wards, big rooms with lots of beds, and they had lots of windows that were open to allow air exchange, which actually was good for infection control. The problem is that when you have open windows, you also get little critters. And to keep those little critters from climbing in the bed with our patients, we would tuck the sides of the sheet all along the mattress to make it very, very tight and that kept things from getting into bed. But if there's a patient in the bed, we don't do that. Good. We'll replace the pillowcase. It doesn't matter when you do that. 
nobody cares. Just replace the pillowcase. But when you put that pillow back on the bed, you want to face the opening of the pillowcase away from the door, away from the traffic patterns. A lot of people walking up and down that hallway. They are all breathing out germs. You don't want those germs to float on air currents into your setting and be able to get into the pillowcase because the opening is facing that direction. Because patients in bed, they tend to sweat or drool, and then we end up with warm, dark, moist areas under that pillowcase, and your patient can breathe in those pathogens all night. It's always best to have the opening facing away from the door. That way, any pathogens land on the surface of the pillowcase exposed to light. And remember, they don't like that. Good. Questions? All right, I am going to show you this one because we're short on time. I am going to show you the video for this one. It's got really good close-ups and overhead view of changing that sheet. Normally I do this one live, but let me do the video on this one just for the sake of time. And then we're gonna do respirations and then I gotta get you started on blood pressure. Okay, so we're running well on time. All right. You can see that this one takes about eight minutes on the video. It doesn't take that long in real life. You have plenty of time. I don't think that this thing charged last night. Ah, that's why. Okay. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. How are you? Wonderful. I need to change your sheets. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to close your curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay. We'll start out with a barrier. I'm going to get a top sheet, a bottom sheet, and a pillowcase and a privacy blanket. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place this blanket over you. This will help protect your privacy and keep you warm while we do this skill, okay? Okay. Okay, I'm going to spread this out. Can you hold that blanket in place? Yes. And I'm going to remove the sheet from the back. We'll place the sheet in very linen. Mr. Jones, can I get you to scoot toward me, please? Thank you. And can you roll up so that you're on your side facing that direction? Thank you. I'll remove the two corners of the sheet from the side of the bed. And I'm going to roll the soiled sheet in toward the patient. I'm going to tuck it up underneath the patient all along the length of the spine. Now I'll take the clean sheet, unfold it.
spread it out on the mattress and attach the corners. Now I'll roll the clean sheet toward me. We'll roll it so that it's tight with no wrinkles as we tuck it under the soil sheet. Okay, Mr. Jones, come on back onto your back, and I need you to scoot to the center of the bed, please. Thank you. Can you scoot toward me, please? And can you roll so that you're laying on your side facing away from me? Thank you. I'll now remove the sheet from the bed that was soiled, wrapping it into a ball. And I'll go place this in dirty linen. Now I'll unroll the clean sheet and secure the corners on the mat. As I do so, I'll make sure to stretch the sheet so that it's flat and minimize the wrinkles that are underneath the patient. Okay, Mr. Jones, can you come back onto your back, please? And scoot to the middle. Thank you. I'm now going to place the top sheet over you. And I'll remove that back one bit now. We'll roll it in a ball and place it in dirty linen. Now I'm going to secure the sheet. I'm going to lift the mattress and smooth the sheet down so that it's flat under the mattress on both sides. Now I'll make hospital corners by lifting the top edge of the sheet about a foot from the end of the mattress, straight up. It'll form a triangle. Everything else will get cut underneath. I'll repeat that on this side. And I'll loosen this over his toes so he has some wiggle room. There, how's that, Mr. Jones? Perfect, thank you. Very good. I'm going to remove the pillow from under your head. I'll bring it right back. I'll remove the pillowcase. Be careful not to allow it to touch my uniform and lay the pillow on the overbed table. We'll place the pillowcase in dirty linen. I'll take the clean pillowcase and scrunch it up all the way to the edges. We'll put the tag side in, place the pillowcase on top of the tag side of the pillow, and pull the sides down. I'll now place the pillow under his head with the opening facing away from the door. How is that, Mr. Jones? Perfect. Thank Are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Here's your call light. If you should need anything at all, please don't hesitate to call. Can I get you something like a magazine? No, thank you. Okay, I'm going to open your curtain and wash my hands. The barrier will be thrown away. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done.
Okay, questions? Please notice for that particular skill, um, everything that I took off of the bed went directly into dirty linen. And there was a dirty linen hamper right at the end of the bed. You will have that for the state exam. They will either have a small hamper at the end of the bed, like what was in the video, or they'll have something like this, which is an industrial hamper. Either way, you're going to put the linens off the bed and into the hamper. Don't put them on the floor. The problem is that these hampers are not in the patient's rooms in the clinical setting. We don't keep dirty things in a clean environment. So you won't have a hamper in a patient room. So what do you do? Well, in a clinical setting, these hampers are usually either in the hallway or in a special room specifically for soil utility. So we actually have special rooms for this. Um, you're not going to take a sheet off the bed and walk it down the hallway. <laughs> I mean, to do that for every sheet would just be ridiculous. So if you can't put it on the floor and there's no hamper, what do you do with it? Well, most facilities have a bag that you'll go get. It actually, it's actually stamped with soiled linens on the bag. Um, they're usually light blue. So you'll go get the bag first, open the bag up, and you can put the bag on the floor. Linens go in the bag. If you can't find a bag, if you don't have one, put a chucks on the floor. The whole point is we need something between those dirty linens and the floor. Good, questions? Questions on that? Uh, real quick, on when you're taking linens off of the bed, check the, to see, are there any dentures, hearing aids, cell phones, earrings, anything like that? Because there's nobody checking those sheets. Uh, you're it. Used to be laundry was the most dangerous job in a healthcare setting. If you worked in laundry, it is it was the most dangerous job. Much higher rate of needle sticks. Much higher rate. Because when you're sorting laundry, you're not expecting used needles. But yet they, they fall onto the bed more often than you would think. So it became a serious problem. Everybody know what Tide Pods are? Right, the little things you throw in the washer with your clothes and they dissolve. Well, we've been using those for years in healthcare, but it's not a, a pod, it's the actual bag. The bag in most settings is water soluble. So when you take linens, put them in the bag and the bag goes to laundry, that whole bag goes right into the washing machine, the whole thing. Yeah. And it dissolves and that becomes the soap. Wow. The bag. Yeah, the bag. Yeah. So not not all places utilize that system, but the point is if there's a hearing aid in those linens and it goes straight into the washer, what's gonna happen to that hearing aid? It's <laughs> yeah, it's ruined. And the facility would have to reimburse the patient. There goes your rates. Good. Make sense? Questions? Moving on. Let's go to page 37. How do we know what to do with this patient? Change care plan. Yeah, let's read the care plan. Care plan says patient will be lying in bed for the skill. Count the patient's respirations for one full minute and record your readings. How long are we counting for? One minute. Okay, respirations is breathing. That's all we're doing, guys. We are counting somebody's breathing. They are laying down, which makes this way easier because you can watch the tummy go up and down and count the breathing. Super easy. Um, nothing to this skill. You're going to do an opening, not, 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 kind of stones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to insert name of skill here, but there's a problem. You don't want to tell somebody you're counting their breathing because if you do, they alter their breathing pattern. So they'll either stop breathing because now you've made them hyper aware or they'll start breathing fast because they're anxious because somebody's watching them. Either way, we're not going to get an accurate reading. So for this skill, we're not going to tell them we're counting their breathing. We're going to say, I'm taking your vital signs. Okay, good. A little sneaky, I know. So um, we've done our opening, we closed the curtain, we washed our hands, and now we're going to count the breathing. 
But there's a little issue with this skill, and it's not going to be readily apparent unless you're the patient for the skill. So I need a patient. Somebody come lay down in that bed for me. Anybody. I had this for Easy, easy. <laughs> you beat me to an hour moment. Thank you. Go ahead and lay down if you would. Okay, this is okay, first thing I want you to pay attention to, I just called her to lay down, right? Mm -hmm. Where did she put herself? In the middle of the bed. I didn't tell her to do that, did I? She knows she's only there for a very short time. You would think she'd be right on the edge because she's she knows she's about to get back up. This is a very, very short thing. But she didn't. She put herself in the middle of the bed. Why did she do that? Natural. Natural. <laughs> that is correct. I did not tell her to do that. She didn't even realize she did that until I said something. <laughs> now she's thinking, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Patients will automatically position themselves in the middle of the bed. It's instinct. It's something we learned at 18 months old when we were working on that spatial awareness thing that we're going to talk more about at a later date. But please be aware the patient does need to be in the middle of the bed. So if you approach a bed and they're not in the middle, you need to prompt them to be in the middle of the bed. Good? All right. So let's say that I'm going to count this patient's respirations. And I'm not telling her I'm counting her respirations. I'm going to say I'm going to take the vital signs. Close burn, wash hands, and now I'm back at the bed. I'm ready to get started. <laughs> How comfortable are you right now? Oh, what are you saying? So look at that. <laughs> this is like a little creepy. What are you doing, dude? Why were you just standing there staring at me? It's awkward. You cannot just stand over somebody and stare at their chest. For how long? What does our care plan say? One a full minute. minute. Oh, you're about to find out just how long a minute is. It's creepy. <laughs> you can't do that. So when you're measuring somebody's respirations, you're not going to stand over there and stare at them. You're going to make them think you're counting their pulse. So if I, can I have my hand a little bit? If I just hold her hand like this. Now, I'm, I don't have her pulse. I'm literally holding her hand. Does that make you feel more comfortable? Isn't that weird? You can't just stare at your patient. It's going to ramp up the anxiety. What do you think that's going to do to their breathing? Yeah, it, it absolutely. It elevates respiratory rate. So normal here is between 12 and 20. In and out counts as one. It doesn't matter whether you start on the in, whether you start in the middle, or whether you're counting on the exhale. The whole thing counts as one. So when you're counting respirations, if you're starting on an exhale, you still count it. The whole thing counts as one. So we're going to count how many respiratory cycles in and out the patient breathes in that entire minute time frame. But be careful because your brain is hardwired to pay attention to what it sees first, hears, and then feels. And the problem is that if we're counting the breathing and we're staring at that clock, we're not really counting the breathing. So you're going to look at the clock, you're going to pick a starting point, and you're going to say start out loud. You're going to count the respirations for a full minute. You're just going to glance up every so often to see where we're at. A little more often when we get closer to the end of the minute. And then you're going to say stop out loud. But there's something you can do to make this a little bit easier. Think of your arms that you're supposed to and just If you look at her, if we're going to count her breathing and you look at her, you can probably see her tummy going up and down a little bit. You guys see that? It's kind of hard to make out though. It's kind of hard to see. See if I can help you just a little bit. You see that? 
I did not alter her breathing. I altered your ability to see it. I use psychology. That's what I use is psychology. I am drawing attention to the movement of her tummy with a contrasting color. You can use that on the test. Perfectly okay. So if you have trouble seeing your restorations, just throw an alcohol pad. There's alcohol pads on the overbed table right beside you. It is allowed to be used on the test. And in fact, you probably don't want those evaluators like breathing down your neck either. You want them on the other side of the room. Preferably the other county would be nice, but at least the other side of the room. Well, if you put an alcohol pad on their tummy, the evaluators can stay on the other side of the room because they can read it from across the room. Good? Mm -hmm. Questions? All right, I'm going to do this whole skill for you from beginning to end. I'm going to do my opening. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to count the respirations. I'm going to do my closing. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to document. I'm going to wash my hands again. I'm going to do the whole thing, right? When I say start out loud, you are going to count her respirations until I say stop. You guys are now the evaluator. And when I'm all done, I'll tell you the number I got, and we'll see how close you are. For the test, as long as you're within two breaths of the evaluator in either direction, two breaths of the evaluator, you are considered. All right, so here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Fantastic. We're going to pretend it's not good. Fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm here to get your Bible study. Is that okay? Okay, let me go ahead and uh, close the curtain. I'm going to go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Okay? Don't wash All right, so now I'm going to wash my hands. Notice I told her I was taking her vital signs. I did not say respirate. I'm going to wet my hands. I'm going to get some soap. Lots of soap. They grade you on bubbles. I'm going to bring my hands together and look at the clock. The second hand was on the 10. Can I turn the camera over? What's that? Can I turn the camera for you? Oh, that's all right. I'm going to uh, wash the tops of my wrists, the backs of my hands, and in between my fingers, both sides, in between my thumb and index finger, both sides. The palm of my hand, both sides. The bottom of my hand by my pinky, both sides. And in between my fingers, both sides. And that's got to be at least 20 seconds, and I meet that. So now I'm going to go down each one of my nails to clean my cuticles. Circle my nails on the palm of my hand. And then rinse. I'm going to tap, keep the water in the sink, not spread it around my environment. I'm going to get some paper towels to dry, but I only want to dry what's clean. Throw those away. Clean dry paper towel to turn my faucet off. All right. Okay, Ms. Jones, this is going to take me about a minute. I just need to set that there for a second. I'll let you know when I'm done, but I will need you to remain quiet during this minute, okay? All right. Everybody see? Can you see? All right. Everybody ready? Ready, set, start. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything I can get for you on? Would you like a menu to do that Are you comfortable?
call light. It's the call light. There we go. Perfect. There's your call light. If you need anything at all, just press that red button. Environment is clean. I'm going to come over here. Press the light stick button and go wash my hands. So while I'm over here, I should be thinking about the steps of my skill. So, um, you guys all open the 37? Yes. Do you see that gray box? Mm -hmm. Somebody read step one on the gray box. Opening and locking down. Did I do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody read step two. I don't know if I do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Step three? Closing. Did I do that? Yeah. Okay, I haven't done step four yet. No. Okay. So I'm still washing my hands. How long should I be washing for? More than 20 seconds. At least 20 seconds of scrubbing and then move on to my, my yeah. nail. So that's what I should be doing while I'm over here washing my hands is thinking about the steps of my skill. And I should be using that gray box. So memorizing the gray boxes are a good thing. They're on the flashcards. So I should be thinking about the steps of my skill. And if I realize that I made a mistake somewhere along the line, I could right now tell the evaluator correction I would have and then correcting whatever my mistake was. But once I'm done, I'm going to and then I'm going to document my reading. Now, that was a long time from counting to documenting. You got to remember that number. You got that all that time. So you got to work on your memory. I have a little index file in my brain. And when I'm doing skills like this, my brain actually writes a number on an index card and puts it in the file. And when I need it, I go back to that file mentally and I pull out that index card. If you visualize it, it actually works. It's crazy, but it works. But decorate your index card file very specifically. Like, decorate it. Imagine it. Does it have purple gemstones? Is it gold and pearl? Decorate it. And that way, your brain has something finite to recall. It works. So I'm going to document my reading. And then I'm going to go wash my hands again. So most of this skill is spent where? Wash your hands. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to wet, get some soap, and we're going to rub the top of our ribs, the back of our hands, in between our thumb and index finger. The bottom of our hand by our pinky and the palm of our hands that are lacing our fingers for at least 20 seconds. And that's 20. Now I'm going to go down to each one of my nails, circle my nails on the palm of my hand. I think I've got good smelling so. Yeah. <laughs> Cap. I look clean. We'll turn that off. Now I can tell the evaluator my skill is done. Thank you. Not too bad, right? Not too bad. Okay. So I got 15. What'd you guys get? 15? 16? Okay. If you got 13, 14, 15, 16, or 17, you are considered accurate. That's a big margin of error. Huge. Remember, normal is between 12 and 20. They're giving you half of that as your margin of error. So plenty of room for wiggle.
Questions? Questions? All right, let's talk about documentation real quick. This is on page 30, it's actually 36. 36. You can read this lesson at home. Um, I'm bringing it to your attention so you can read, read, uh, read it at home. But a couple of things about documentation. Most CNAs in most settings do not document using words. Most CNAs in most settings are limited to numbers. Pulse, respiration, feeding percentages, urinary drainage bags, that type of thing. You may have a checklist of things where you check off. I did a uh, partial bed bath or hand care or foot care, but not many places let CNAs document with words. And that's because documentation is uh, legal. It can be called into a court of law if there's a lawsuit. And um, there's some legal principles here that we have to discuss. If you're documenting with words, be accurate, be brief, but be complete. Try to limit your use of I statements. You don't want to say, well, I noticed that whatever. Um, try to limit your use of I statements. Everything should always focus on the patient. So the patient was laying in bed and stated this. Make sense? So if, um, one other thing, don't document if you didn't do it. So you have to document at the time you do things and don't pre-document. We had I was a hospice case manager for five years. We had a CNA at the bedside of a dying patient, round the clock care. And the CNA was there for like eight or 12 hours a shift, an overnight shift. And she was bored. I mean, it was nighttime. She was bored. So they were doing every 15 minute checks and they would document, you know, every 15 minutes, patient resting comfortably. So she, because she's bored, thought she'd get a jump on it. And just started documenting her 15 minute checks. Well, the patient died that night at like two o'clock in the morning. And I've got 315, the patient <laughs> was breathing well with no discomfort noted. It's a legal document. I can't wipe that out. Yikes. That's a big yikes. She was at the bedside. It was private duty. It was in the patient's home. Oh, she, yes, she did. She called the office at two, but she had documented up oh, until right. four. Yeah. Yeah. So try to explain that to the medical examiner. <laughs> so be careful, guys. Accurate, free, complete, but only document what you did when you did it. Don't free document. I know that one's like crazy. I've seen a lot of things. All right, so a couple things uh, to remember for this skill. Don't tell the patient that you're counting their breathing. In and out is one full cycle. Always reported over one minute, but we don't always count over one minute. Sometimes we can count for 15 seconds, multiply that by four and get our one minute reading. Um, how do we know which method to use with which, which patients? The care plan. Normals between 12 and 20, we're going to say start when we start counting, stop when we stop counting. That way the evaluator's on board with us and they're counting at the same time we are. And then we're going to document. Now, during the test, that was a lot of hand washing. <laughs> a lot of hand washing. During the test, after your first skill, the evaluators are going to tell you you can simulate hand washing for the remainder of the test. So then you would just say, my hands are clean. I've just washed my hands. You don't have to pan them on. You don't have to go to the sink. You're just verbally place holding when you would wash your hands. And man, that speeds everything up. Where do those evaluators want to be? That's right. In their pool, sipping their Mai Tai. That is correct. You are the only thing standing in their way. 
All right, go to page 38. Really quick for those of you um, that are inclined to practice, page 32 of your book, after we get done with this, um, is a really good activity for you to help identify normals and abnormals. Page 32 and 33. 32 tells you all your normal values, 33 is an activity. It's something that you might want to consider doing because you will have on um, the state exam some questions on normal. All right, blood pressure is not tested on the state exam. You are not going to have to demonstrate blood pressure on the state test. It is not a tested skill. You do have to know it, however, you may have some questions on the written exam about blood pressure. A lot of places use automated cuffs right now because we can't trust you. The way that simple. Um, so most places use automated cuffs, but if you get an abnormal reading on an automated cuff, you should always double check it manually. Let's say that our we have a patient, we use an automated cuff, put it on the arm, press our little button. It gives us some numbers. And the numbers it gives us are really high. Are you sure the patient has high blood pressure or could it be the machine was malfunctioning? <laughs> Yeah. Could be. How would we know the difference? That's right. Manually double check it. You've got to rule out a possible machine problem. So that's why you have to learn how to take a manual blood pressure. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, guys, don't get too comfortable with machines doing your job because if you get too comfortable, machines will do all your job. They're taking them. They're taking them. Yeah. So don't don't rely too much on machines. All right. So we're going to get into our equipment in a minute. Go ahead and unpack your blood pressure cuffs and stethoscopes, goods, but then set them aside and don't play with them yet. I got to explain to you what a blood pressure is first. And then we got to talk about our equipment and how to use it. And then we'll actually get into blood pressure. So let's talk about what a blood pressure is. So we've seen this graph before. We saw this with pulse. So your heart contracts and it pushes out a wave of blood. That wave pushes the one in front of it. That one pushes the one in front of it and so on. This is how blood moves through your circulatory system. When we counted pulse, we put our fingers and pressed down on that artery and felt these thumps going through. Counted them, and it told us how many times it hurt. That was pulse. Blood pressure, same artery, same heart, same waves. But now what we want to do, we, we don't care about counting them. That's what we have the pulse for. What we want to do is figure out how much pressure is inside this artery when a wave is moving through and how much pressure is in between the waves. So this is your top number of your blood pressure or systolic. This is your bottom number of your blood pressure or diastolic. So let me put this in terms you can understand because that was way too scientific. You have a hose on a garden spigot outside, a faucet. And you go out to that faucet and you turn it all the way up. Water goes through the hose. The hose expands, gets hard. Lots of pressure inside, water pressure, right? Turn that hose all the way off. The water drains out. The hose gets squishier, less pressure inside. Make sense? Got to have some pressure inside, otherwise it would just flatten down like pancakes, right? So the actual surface of the hose helps, it is somewhat rigid to help keep its shape. Make sense? Okay. So, that's what your heart does. Your heart is standing at the faucet and it's just going on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, about 70 times a minute, on, off, on, off. What I want to know is how much pressure is inside that hose when the water's on, how much pressure is inside the hose when the water's off. 
and we're going to use a gauge to help us find that out. Good, you guys understand a little bit about this? Now, we're in Florida, hot Florida sun. If we take that hose, we put it outside in the blistering sunlight for 10 years, turn that water on full force for 10 years, and water is always going through this, this hose at full force, sun is beating down on it, lots of stress, at full force for 10 years. What do you think is going to happen to that hose? That's right. In the body, we call that an aneurysm if it happens in the body or a stroke when it happens in the brain. If you have consistently high pressure inside the artery and you have external stress forces, you are at risk for a stroke or an aneurysm. So our goal is to find a problem before it becomes a problem. We go around and check blood pressures. You got high blood pressure, you got high, you, 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 you know, you do. All right, I can report that to the nurse. What we're trying to do is find a problem that the nurse can solve before it becomes a big problem. So remember I said, uh, nurses are looking for real and potential problems. Yeah. This falls firmly in the camp of potential problems that we're trying to prevent. So CNAs aren't, remember CNAs be normal? You guys remember that? Yes. Right, so CNAs aren't taking blood pressures, super high blood pressures on super sick patients. That's not what we do. We do normal. We are on an Easter egg hunt trying to find some high blood pressures to report. So because of that, we are only going to inflate this cup to about 160, 180. If you go up over 200, that hurts. You know what effect pain has on blood pressure? What does pain make blood pressure do? It goes up. Right, we're trying to find high blood pressure, but did we really find high blood pressure because high blood pressure? No. So we have to be careful here. So we, we don't want to go over 180. 180 is a good stopping point for us. Make sense? So I saw a really cute cartoon and I meant to put it in this presentation. I was flipping through um, one, social media the other day. I can't remember which one. This really cute cartoon, and it's got a, a guy in like Dr. Scrubs, and he's taking blood pressure, right? And the cup is squeezing the guy's arm so hard, and the guy's got this huge look of pain on his face, and the arm is like black. Oh, yeah. And the doctor says, "Yeah, we'll we'll look into what's going on with your arm after we take your blood pressure." Well, the blood pressure is what's causing what's going on with the arm, and unfortunately, we do that in healthcare a lot. We cause a problem that wasn't a problem before we caused the problem. <laughs> and then we focus on the problem. It's not really a problem. <laughs> so we have to be careful not to use this really circular type of logic, right? So 180 is as high as we go. Now, if the patient has high blood pressure over 180, and I'm gonna explain how we learned that in a minute, um, then we just go to the nurse and say, hey, the blood pressure is over 180. We don't need a number. Over 180, bad. Doesn't matter whether it's a little bad, a lot bad, it's all bad. So we're going to go find a nurse and say, hey, high blood pressure. And the nurse is going to recheck it because they can't trust your reading. I'm not picking up a phone and calling a doctor at 3 a.m. to tell him, Blood pressure is 180 over 110, and he's going to say, are you sure? Did you check it? And if I say no, that doctor's going to hang up on me. So you don't need a specific number. You don't need to take the blood pressure over and over and over again until you get it dialed in and know exactly what it is. Nobody cares. High is high. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is if you take the blood pressure too many times, it's going to elevate each time you take it. It gets higher and higher. That's because pain raises blood pressure 
and you're squeezing the heck out of this arm and it's going to respond by freaking out. <laughs> and that's going to raise the blood pressure. So twice on one arm and then move to the next arm. If you can't get the blood pressure, move to another patient and let the nurse know. Twice on one arm, move to the next arm, move to the next patient. You're not going to get every blood pressure you try for. There's some blood pressures I can't hear. And I have decent hearing honed over years of practice. But there are some blood pressures I just can't really pick up all that well. You will have some in your career as well. The worst thing to do is fake it. If you can't get it, you can't get it. It's fine. Let's go find somebody else that maybe has a little bit better set of listeners. We also have electronic um, stethoscopes that we can use to really pick up and amplify sounds. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. But don't lie. I'll give you a real world example of this. It's very personal. I have high blood pressure. Not all the time. I have episodic high blood pressure. So when I was younger, it's a little bit more under control now than it was back in the day. But when I was younger, um, my blood pressure would routinely go up to 240, 260. Yeah. And I was having an issue. I had a really blinding headache. And usually that's, for me, that tells me my blood pressure is up. And um, I had a nurse friend take my blood pressure and she's like, it's high. So I went to my doctor. The medical assistant comes in, what are you here for? I said, my blood pressure. And she puts the cuff on, she puts her stethoscope in backwards. We'll talk about that in a minute. She inflates the cuff up to about 160 and goes, whoop all the way down to zero and says your blood pressure is fine. Okay, well, my bottom number or diastolic was over 160. So she didn't even, she wasn't even in the ballpark. She wasn't even in the state the ballpark is in and declared my blood pressure was okay. So the doctor comes in, he says, what are you here for? I said, blood pressure. He looked at the chart, he says, your blood pressure is fine. I said, no, my blood pressure is not fine. I need you to take it. So he took it and he looked at me and he pumped it up again and he looked at me and he pumped it up again and he's like, you need to go to the hospital like right now. And I said, no, I really don't. They've done workups on me. I just need a clonidine. You know, give me a prescription for clonidine and it'll get it down. And so he did and, and with instructions that I had to go to the ER if my blood pressure did not come down. But if I had not known, I would have walked out of that doctor's office and probably had a stroke. Chances are. Now, the fact that it would have been the medical assistant's fault, does that bring me any comfort? No. 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 So I also explained to the doctor that he probably needed a little more training with his staff. Because things are getting missed. I guarantee it. Thankfully, I was able to advocate for myself, not all patients. So this is serious, guys. This is not something that we're going to fake it till we make it. This is something that if you don't get it, you need to let me know. Now, it's going to be hard at first. It's going to be hard. It's going to take some practice. You can master this, I have no doubt. And I'm gonna give you a ton of tips right now to help increase your odds of success. But the one thing I can't do for you guys is practice. It takes about 45 blood pressures before you even start to get accurate. You are not gonna be accurate today. You're not even gonna be in the ballpark today. You may think you are, but you're not. So I need you to follow me very closely over the next half hour. Don't start playing with your equipment. Don't let your minds wander. This is probably the one lecture that 
even though you're not being tested on it, is the one that's going to save lives. So we got to get it right. Good. All right. So we're going to use two pieces of equipment to make this possible. We're going to use a stethoscope and a sphygmomanometer, also known as a blood pressure cup. <laughs> <laughs> in a clinical setting, you may hear it uh, described as a sphygmomanometer. So you need to be aware that that word exists. In nursing school, I had to be able to spell the word. That was a grade. Um, so yes, but it's um, what that is is the gate. We call it the blood pressure cuff, but the sphygmomanometer is actually the gauge. It's the thing that's going to tell us how much pressure is inside the arteries during a wave and in between waves. So let me explain to you how this works. It's actually remarkably simple. So we take this cuff and we put it on the arm and we secure it so it's snug around the arm. Mm -hmm. And then we add air and the air fills up the cuff and it pushes in on the arm. And when you compress the arm, we're compressing everything inside the arm too, which is the arteries and the veins. Now in this case, the artery is the one that we're worried with, okay? So we're compressing that artery and just like a straw, if you compress a straw, like if you take your straw and pinch it, it's not gonna let anything through, right? That's what we're doing here. We're putting the cuff on, we're inflating the cuff, it's pressing in and we're closing off that artery, just like this. Then we let the air out slowly. And as the air slowly gets let out, that artery starts to open a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. And eventually it's open enough that a wave can push its way through. There's enough pressure inside the wave to push its way through. And when it does, because the artery is still small, it hits the top of the artery and it makes a thump sound. What we're listening to is a wave of blood hitting the top of the artery. That's what makes the thump sound. Now, as the cuff continues to deflate and the artery gets bigger and bigger, more waves go through. Thong, 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 because they're all hitting the top of the artery. Thong, thong, thong. But they start to decrease in sound because they're not hitting the top of the artery as far. Make sense? Good. So when we're taking a blood pressure, I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase here. When we're taking a blood pressure, we close off that artery. We're not going to hear anything because our straw is crimped. So as that needle comes down, it's quiet. It's quiet. It's still quiet. Still quiet. 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 And your brain is going to start freaking out. I'm not hearing anything. Am I doing this right? Did I miss it? What is happening? Nothing happening. Show hasn't started yet. Don't give up. Quiet, 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 thump. Where the needle is, the number that that needle is pointing to when you hear your first thump is your top number of your blood pressure. That was the first wave that was able to make it through and hit the top of the artery. The needle's going to show us how much pressure is inside the artery at that moment. Well, one wave was able to get through, so other waves will also get through. Thong, 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 and we're letting the air out, so then the artery is getting bigger. Thong, 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 and they're going to get softer. Thong. Then you're going to stop hearing thongs. The number that the needle is pointing to when you hear the last clear thump is your problem number. So we inflate the cup, we deflate the cup slowly and smoothly. We listen for the first thump, whatever needle 
And remember the needle's pointing at, that's your top number. We hear more thunks, don't care about them. We hear the last clear thunk, that's your bottom number. And then it's gonna be quiet again. So inflate, quiet, thunks, quiet. Where's first, where's the last? Inflate, quiet, thunks, quiet. You're looking for the first and the last. Good? Okay. Some of you are going to have a hard time with the first number. You're my dreamers. If you have a brain that goes out and picks daisies when it gets quiet, you're going to have a hard time with this. So we inflate up to 180, and the needle starts to come down, and it's quiet, quiet, quiet. Oh, I'm hungry. I wonder what I should thunk, have for thunk, lunch, thunk, maybe thunk, taco, thunk, bell, thunk. Oh, crap, where was the first one? You're my dreamers. If you know that you're going to have a problem there, you can start working on strategies to help you pay attention. Now, on the other hand, I have my dancers. My dancers are rhythm people. Now, a heart is a very rhythmical organ. It gives us a rhythmical beat, right? And, yeah, let the beat drop, right? Here's a beat. And we start getting into the rhythm of it to the point that we will actually fill in beats that aren't there. Oh, no. Right. <laughs> so you may have trouble with the bottom number, or you could be like me and have trouble on both. Man, I am a dreamer and a dancer, right. and yeah. learning blood pressure was hard for me. But if you understand these two forces in action, you can start to work on strategies to help overcome them and focus in on the sounds you need. Does that make sense? But you are a dreamer, or you are a dancer, or you are both. But nobody gets this on the first try. What were some of the strategies that helped you? Okay, I'm going to tell you a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when I was in nursing school, and I was learning this, when I was in LPN school, and I was learning blood pressure, my, and I had a fantastic instructor, I mean, don't get me wrong, but the instruction for blood pressure really was, okay, inflate the cup, deflate, listen for the first and the last. Go practice. Go what? Go what? I don't know what I'm doing. How am I supposed to practice this? And I did not, I couldn't get it. I just could not get it. And I graduated nursing school. I became a nurse, passed my state four. Now, by the way, I graduated top of my nursing school, right? Still didn't have blood pressure down, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> I get into work and I, I was really struggling and I was working in a hospital setting and I just, I, I couldn't get it. And we had automated cuffs, but I couldn't double check it manually. And I was really stressed. So I finally found a preceptor and I said, okay, I'm going to sound stupid. I get it. I, I understand. I know I'm a nurse, but I'm just struggling with this. I'm not getting it. And she said, well, congratulations, because you are brave enough to admit that. Mm -hmm. And that's when your learning actually begins. Mm -hmm. So she took me aside and she's the one that taught me what I'm teaching you. So, and she explained dreamers and dancers, although she didn't use that terminology. She just said some people have trouble on the top because their minds wander. Some people have trouble on the bottom. Um, so, and, and I started to put the pieces together. I came up with dreamers and dancers, but um, it took some, it took one-on-one. -on -one. It took some, it took me having enough self-confidence to be able to admit that I didn't get it and finding the right person to teach me. So that was my strategy, but it was, I mean, I was already a nurse and still didn't have it. So 
don't be hard on yourself. This takes a little bit of time. But that's why I told you in the very beginning, I want you to practice this and then let me know if you're struggling. Because I do have some tips that I can share with you. Okay, good. But I'm going to go over the basics with you and then you're going to practice. So there's two pieces of equipment that we need to do this. The first is a stethoscope. This is a microphone. That's it. It's a microphone. So this end of your microphone, for those of you who have a double tube stethoscope that looks like mine, I'm going to talk to you first. Single tubes, I'll talk to you in a minute. So if you have a double tube like mine, this head of the stethoscope, there's two sides to it. This is a diaphragm. This is a bell. You don't need to know that, but that's their names. Only one side is on at any given time. You have to tell the stethoscope which side you want to listen to. Remember, it's a microphone, but we don't want to amplify everything out here. We only want to amplify what's inside the body. So only one side of this works. This whole thing, you see this whole head? Mm -hmm. It turns. It turns. So down here is a flat bar, probably with a little dot on it. That flat bar tells you which side is on. You want your large diaphragm to be facing the direction of that flat bar. So if you try to listen to this side now, you're not going to hear anything. We're telling the stethoscope, this is the side we need. Guys, we're listening to a wave of blood hitting the top of an artery, buried under muscle, fat, and tissue. You need a big microphone. <laughs> Don't use a little guy. This isn't going to cut it. You need a big microphone for this. Okay? So these double tubes, your whole head of the stethoscope turns. Make sure the large diaphragm is facing the same direction as your flat bar. Now, I bring this up because you're probably going to bundle this up when you're done today and shove it in a bag of some sort. And this little sucker will flip around on you and you'll take it out tonight, try to practice on somebody at home and you can't hear a thing, nothing. Stethoscope is dead. Take a look, make sure that your stethoscope is on before you start to freak out, okay? Believe it or not, oh, hold on. That was double tube. I need to come talk to you single tube people. <laughs> All right, so let me go around the room. Your, you have a dot. See your dot? This whole thing turns. Just like this double tube. That's your dot. So you want your, your large diagram to be facing your dot. Now, notice how easy that was. It's really easy. So your it may flip around on you. You have you have a dot. So that's where you have a dot. Okay. You should have a dot. Good. Okay, you've got a double tube. You don't have a dot. No. So these are a bit trickier. You have to, sorry. You have to look through here. Now I want you to look through that hole and look at the change. You see, see there? You can see all the way through. Yeah, it's good. See it? So this you can actually see all the way through it. And then this one, there's a thing blocked for you. Okay. okay, so when it's here, you're amplifying this. Here, sorry, the garbage. Nail polish. Good idea, yeah, girl. I'm very confused. <laughs> Here's a single way. Single direction, so you don't have to worry about flipping yours. It's only one direction. Okay, so you're good. Okay, let me take a look yours. You're fine. Your head? My head. I need a pocket. Oh, that's frustrating. So you've got a dot here. The whole thing turns. Yours turns very easy as well. So you've got a dot. Yours should be single. Okay, yours will be single. So, oh, 
Okay, yours is different. You have a lift one. Yours is single, so you don't have to adjust yours. Litman is similar to hers. So if you lift your hair, you're taller. Look at that one. And then if I turn this, yeah, turn this. Now you can probably see in to it, right? That means that this side is amplified. This one is very hard to turn. So it's not going to flip over on you by accident, but um, it may be difficult for you to turn and you may kind of struggle with that. All right, so as important as that section is, it's not nearly as important as this part is. Ear tips um, have to be adjusted and then put in the right way. So yours are already preset. Yours are already preset. Do you see how, can you hold your kind of up? See how hers kind of curve? You can see this, how they point that way. If you look at mine, mine are straight, right? Pointy, straight. Straight is no good. We need to be pointy. So hers are preset, yours are preset. I think yours are preset and yours. Everybody else, listen up. You guys can all take a nap for a second. All right, this straight is no good. Your ear canals are not straight. Our ear canals actually face our nose. They, they go in our head and face our nose. So what we wanna do is if you hold the chin strap thing here, you can turn these ear tips so they have a curve to them. Like that? Yeah, yours are already preset. Oh, You're good. Wait, there. Yeah. See how they- So it's this way then. No, wait, it's this way because it's going towards the nose. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about which way, but yours are already preset. They're not straight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when you put these in your ears, everybody does this backwards. I don't know why our default is backwards. When you put these in your ears, they have to face away from you. So you, you see how these ear tips face that way? Right, you see that? They face away from me. They face the patient. Because everything in our life is about the patient. patient. So when I put these in my ears, I want to make sure they face away from me. So I'm going to put them in my ears. And then I'm going to tap my diaphragm. The ears are backwards. So turn the whole thing around. There you go. You always want it to face away from the side. Put them in that way. Yep, put them in. Tap your diaphragm. Okay. Good. Take it out. So. Ow. I got yeah, a little too straight here. Right. Okay. So let me just prove this to you really quickly. So you, you have them in your ears with them facing away from you. Mm -hmm. Just flip the whole thing around and put them in so they're backwards and tap your diaphragm again. Uh, so so <laughs> yeah. Oh. So now turn them back around right, put them in your ears, and then tap your diaphragm. Thank you. Are you guys seeing that? Yeah. Yeah. What a different it does. it does. I have people that come next door and buy very expensive my or my stethoscopes, and then they'll bring them back a day or two later and say they don't work. Mm -hmm. And I'll either flip the diaphragm around or I'll turn them around and say, now try. Because everybody puts these in backwards. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. 
All right, so now let's talk about the cup. The cups are not one size fits all. They're one size fits most, but not all. But the professional ones have this measuring stripe built right in. So your home cup, those of you that have the metal bars, they are not going to have a tape measuring stripe. Professional cups are going to have a white stripe. This white stripe is going to decide whether this cup is right for your patient. What you would do is take your how far are you? If I was unsure whether this cup is going to fit her arm, I would take this white stripe and put it underneath her arm an inch above the, the elbow, just like this. And I'm going to wrap it around. If it wraps more than halfway around the arm, it's too big for her. If it wraps less than a third of the way around, it's too small. So if I can't see either one of these corners, it's too small. Yeah. Sure. So you take the white stripe underneath the arm, an inch above the elbow, wrap it around the back of the arm. If it wraps more than halfway around, it's too big. Okay. If I can't see either corner, it's too small. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. So on the front of your cup is a gauge, a bulb, a strip, and a marking. So there's four pieces here. The first thing I want you to do is take your gauge. The back of the gauge has a little clip. You press down on the bottom of the clip, the top magically opens. <laughs> this strip, fabric strip here, we want to open our gauge, the top of our gauge, and slide it up our strip so that it's firmly attached. Don't use the little prongs. You want it firmly attached. Guys, this thing is heavy. If you don't have this firmly attached to your cuff when you're putting it on and taking it off, this thing can fall. And what's usually right under there is your patient's wrist. And if they have osteoporosis, you will shatter their wrist. This gauge has to be attached to the cuff when you're putting the cuff on and taking it off to prevent injury. Below that is a little artery marking. Let me talk to you about that. If you remember, I said that we are listening to a wave of blood hitting the top of an artery buried under muscle, fat, and tissue. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. We're going to use a microphone. We're going to use a microphone to hear that wave of blood hit the top of the artery. Microphone. We need to make sure that microphone is in the right place. I've got the microphone here. You're going to hear me just fine. If I put the microphone over here, not so much. Right? I think I have the microphone in the right place. That means that you've got to find the artery in your patient to know where to put the microphone. Good? Do you remember what a pulse felt like last Wednesday? Thumps under the finger. If we find the thumps, we know we're over the artery because that's where the thumps live, right? So what we're going to do is find our brachial artery. So to do that, you're going to hold your arm out. Make sure that that elbow is popped straight up. Don't get lazy on me. Get that elbow popped straight up. At the fold of the elbow where your lines are, two fingers, not your thumb. Remember, we never use our thumb? Right. Two fingers, and it's on the pinky side. So you see my pinky? It's on the pinky side of my elbow at the line. So if I use two fingers, set them there, put my thumb on the back side, I should feel some thumps. Make sure your arm is straight and elbow popped. It is not in the middle. Everybody tries to go in the middle. It is on the inside, the inner aspect. Everybody find your thumbs. Did anybody not find your thumbs? Do you have thumbs? 
thumps. Yeah, thumps, thump, thump. No. Okay. Now, keep your fingers there. So I've got my my artery right here. I'm feeling my thumbs. Keep my fingers there, but let my elbow relax. Oh, oh what happened to your thumbs? So. <laughs> Yeah, do you feel them? How many of you lost your thumbs? I did. Yeah, quite a few. Get that elbow pop back out, and there they are again. That's right. So when you're trying to find an artery on a patient at home this weekend, if they get lazy on you, you're not going to be able to find your thumbs. Okay? Make sure that arm is straight. Now, used to be because we're, we have to put our stethoscope where the artery is. So we found the artery, yep, there it is. I feel it right there. So I can put an X mark the slot. Now I know where to put my stethoscope because that's where I felt the thumbs, right? Pen, X marks the slot, know where to put my, do you think your patient left you writing on them with a pen? No, no. Probably not, so there's a better way. So, on your blood pressure cuff, underneath your gauge is a little artery marking. You may have an arrow that says right arm, left arm. You may have a line with a circle. You have an artery marker on your cuff. So instead of having to write on our patients, we lay this on the arm. Don't secure it. So I'm just, just watch me right now. Don't get, don't do it yet. But if you lay this on the upper arm of your patient, just lay it there. Don't secure it. Just lay it in place. Find your artery. There it is. Line your arrow up with where you feel the artery. This becomes your X mark. Then you want to secure this snugly around the arm. You don't want it to move. You want it snug around the arm. You want enough area here that you can put your stethoscope. If I have a microphone here, you'll hear me fine. What happens if I put my hand over that microphone? It muffles it, right? It deadens or flattens the sound. Well, if you shove that microphone or stethoscope underneath the cup, you're going to deaden or flatten the sound. So we want the cup to end before our microphone begins. How many of you guys have ever had a blood pressure taken yeah. where they shove the stethoscope the underneath? Yeah. yeah. Not good practice. Not good practice. Right. Good? Makes sense? You see why I say blood pressure takes me a long time to teach you because I've got all these little pieces to explain to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you don't know all of these little things, you're not going to be successful when we put it all together. Mm -hmm. Good? All right. So we just went through that. So let's go to um, page 39. Or 38, I'm sorry, 38. And you see this graphic at the bottom of page 38. So how far up do we go with CNAs? 20, 20. One, yep. So somewhere up here between 160 and 180 is where we're gonna stop. So, and then we're slowly gonna deflate. Now you are in control of how fast this needle goes. Mm -hmm. If the needle goes, woo, that's you. <laughs> that's not the needle, that's you. So this takes a little bit of eye-hand coordination, guys. So we're going to inflate the cup and then we're slowly and smoothly going to deflate that cup all the way to zero. You're in control of this. Don't um, don't inflate it unless it's wrapped around something because you can blow up the, the bubble inside. Right? So 
Yeah, common. Um, all right, so we're going to inflate up to between 160 and 180. We're going to de don't do that. You're going to break your cuff. So we're going to deflate smoothly all the way to zero. Notice I did not say until you stop hearing thumps. I said you're going to deflate smoothly all the way to zero. zero. That is correct. Because the heart doesn't take a break. Thump, 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 thump. But every once in a while, it will pause long enough to grab a cup of coffee from the break room. Okay? So you can have a thump, 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 right? Just a little tiny pause in there. And if you think that, oh, I didn't hear any more, that's the last one, you may miss some because you stopped listening too early. Good questions. Okay, so we got to figure out how to read these numbers. It's not as easy as you think. You'll notice it's marked in 20s. I got a 20, a 40, a 60, an 80, a 100, 120, and so on. The big lines in between are your 10s. So this is 20, 30 is not marked, but it's that big line. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and so on. Those little teeny tiny marks are twos. So if you look here, you see 80. I have 82, 84, 86, 88, 90. Good? Okay. No. <laughs> All right. Remember that we inflate up to about 180-ish, right? So when this needle is coming down, it is moving backwards, backwards. You have to take that into consideration because if you hear a sound right here, remember that needle is moving backwards. That is not 122. It's 118. Make sense? Mm -hmm. The needle is moving backwards. The numbers are increasing frontwards. Good. Okay. So up until now, I told you we're going to inflate our cuff, we're going to deflate our cuff, and we're going to listen for the first thump. We're going to hear more and the last clear thump, right? We're listening for these two events. I did not say anything about counting the thumps, watching the needle jump. I didn't talk about any of that, right? We inflate, we deflate, and we listen. Now, this is going to trip some of you way up. Because when you inflate this, this cuff and you start to deflate, your needle's going to do something like this. Okay? That doesn't have any bearing on the blood pressure. None. Zero. And yet a lot of people will record what they see. Has nothing to do. All that means, all that. Let me tell you what that thing is. Let me show you. Because it's important that you understand this. Remember this? Right? Well, we closed off this artery. We put up a toll road. We inflated the cup. No thumps are getting in. No thumps are getting out. Right? Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. The heart is still working. The heart is still beating. It better be. <laughs> well, we are in real trouble here. So every time that heart creates another wave of blood, it's going to slam into the ones in front of it. And that causes a ticking. All it is is mechanical. It's a wave slamming into the ones in front of it. It is not the blood pressure. Okay. Actually, a couple of YouTube videos, it'll tell you. Yeah, wherever you see the needle starts to affect your blood pressure. No, it's not. 
It's what you hear that we're recording. Man, that just burns my goodness. <laughs> People on YouTube that give a misinformation. All right. So if we're looking at this, and we inflated to 180, we slowly deflated, and we heard our first thump right here. This is our num our line for 100. So this is 102, 104, 106. That was our first thump. So that's our top number. Top number is 106. It's solid. It's solid. 106. And then we hear more thumbs. We don't care about those. They don't count. Thump, 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 thump. But the problem is, the last one's not going to tell you the last one. It doesn't say, get ready, get set, here I come, ta da. It doesn't do that. It just goes thump, 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 thump. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Where was that last one? Do you have to pay attention to all of them because they could be the last one. You won't know if it's the last one until another one shows up. Okay, so thump, 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 thump. And then we hear the last one here. We know it's the last one because no more come after it. So if this is the line for 60, this is 62, 64, 66. So our blood pressure is 106 over 66. Got it? Sure. <laughs> Look at page 39. And in the middle of the gray column, you'll see number eight and nine. I know these are really small and hard to see do the best you can. So if you look at number eight, you can see the little picture there to the right. It tells you where the first thump was heard and where the last thump was heard. Can anybody tell me what the blood pressure reading is? 130 over 90. Everybody got that? Everybody understand how we got that? Oh, never mind. I was looking at the wrong one. Oh, okay. 130 over 90. Everybody understand how we got that? Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about normals. Normals. So now that we got the number, we got to figure out what to do with it. Normal for systolic or top number is between 100 and 119. What did we get? 130. Is that between 100 and 119? No. This is abnormal. What do we do with abnormals? Reporting to the nurse. Yep. One abnormal is enough for us. Even if the bottom was in range, doesn't matter. We got one abnormal, that's enough. Two abnormals is even more special. Okay, so bottom number or diastolic normal was 60 to 79. We got 90. Is that normal? No. So what do we do? Yeah, if I got one normal, I could walk leisurely down the hallway. If I got two normals, I probably ought to add a little pep in my step. Don't have to run. But if you remember, I said that where we hear the first thump is our top number, right? So where we hear a first thump is our top number. So if I get ready to take a blood pressure, I get the cuff on and I inflate up to 180 like I always do. And all of a sudden, right away, I hear thumps. Well, I know that the top number is where I first heard a thump, but I first means there has to be quiet in front of it. We didn't get to quiet. We jumped right into thumps. So that means my top number is somewhere over 180. Now I'm gonna continue taking this blood pressure because I'd like to, if I can't get the top number, I'd at least like to get the bottom one. So I'm gonna deflate and listen for that last thump. I've already got first one immediately. I'm gonna listen for that last one and then I'm gonna go find a nurse with a lot of pep in my staff. And I'm gonna to say top number somewhere over 180. Bottom number was whatever it is. And then watch them run. Okay. 
Now, there are some people that can live with very high blood pressures for very long periods of time with no ill effects. I mean, like you look at them and go, are you feeling okay? <laughs> and it's just normal for them. There's people that live with very low blood pressures and that's normal for them. Good. We don't judge. We're non-judging. We're just reporting. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we get up to 160, 180, wherever we're stopping and we hear thumps right away, we know the top numbers above that because remember you have to have quiet to find the first. We didn't find our pocket of quiet. We don't need to. High is high. We don't need to know how high. Good. All right, so let's go on to number 10. If you look at number 10, what is this person's blood pressure? Okay. That brings up a very good point. So if we look at this dial, and you know, a lot of people do that, they, they use odd numbers. But if we look at this dial, right? First of all, you're not really going to hear a thump in the space between two lines. That would be like really, really specific. Mm -hmm. Um, because a, a thump is really going to kind of last like a couple of ticks, you know, thumps are kind of, they take up space. <laughs> so when we inflate this and deflate it, we want to about, I heard the first one about here and the next one about, or the last one about here, it's not going to be specific enough to grab an odd number. And if you report an odd number, the nurse knows you're guessing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, automated cuffs can do odd numbers. Automated cuffs way more specific than we are. So they're way more specific than we are. Now, the, the problem is that our human brain, uh, human brains are really remarkable things, but they're somewhat limited because bear with me here, you're listening for thump. Your eyes are watching the dial to see where the needle is when you hear the thumps. Your hand is controlling how fast the needle moves to get to the thumps and your brain has to coordinate all of that. So your brain has to tell your hand, hey, deflate the cup. Your hand tells the eyes, watch the needle. Your eyes tell your ears, are you hearing anything? And your brain is like, give me some numbers. So there's a lot going on up here. And that's why it's really, really hard to get an odd number. Now machines can do this a little more exact than we can. So machines will give you odd numbers. Humans usually try to stay away from odd numbers because the nurse knows you're guessing. You're, you might be in the ballpark, but you're you're not saying it with any level of certainty. Does that make sense? I had a student of mine, and this broke my heart. This really did. Probably about five, six years ago. Um, and this is why I talk about odd numbers is because of this situation. Because I didn't used to talk about odd numbers. But this CNA the, took my class, became cert took the test, became certified, went out there, went to work. And a couple of years into her um, work uh, career, she reported an odd number, 139 over 77 or something like that. I don't know what the number was. And a nurse totally embarrassed her in front of the entire staff. You know, took a, took a cup and said, all right, point to an odd number on that number. Point to a mark that shows an odd number on that dial. And you can't because there aren't any. And I mean, really made her belittle her. And that's horrible. That nurse should be taken out back and done horrible things with. Right? That, that, that's an education opportunity, not a belittling opportunity. And that was the wrong way to handle it. 
I am always on the side of the CNA. But the nurse did have the point. Wrong approach, but there was an education opportunity there. So because of that, I now, so I don't know if that nurse is still out there. Guys. Right here in our community. I don't know if she's still out there. So be aware that odd numbers show a certain level of uncertainty. Good. Questions? Okay. So the way this works, can you come up here? If I hadn't have a seat, yeah, I know I got wires everywhere. Deadlines. Patient's feet need to be flat on the floor, not crossed. Crossed feet can interfere with blood pressure readings. Your arm, patient's arm needs to be supported. Can you place your arm up there? We want to ask the patient, which arm can we use? If the patient has an arm that can't be used, they'll know it, they'll tell us. It could be on the care plan as well. When you're practicing at home on live people, you want to ask the person you're practicing on, Aunt Sally, is there an arm that I can't use? If Aunt Sally has an arm that can't be used, she's going to let you know. So a lot of reasons we can't use an arm. If the patient had a stroke, we don't want the side that was affected. If they're on dialysis and have a shunt or a graft, we don't want that side. If they played Humpty Dumpty and had to be put together with rods and pins and plates and screws <laughs> because they tell off a lot. Yes. <laughs> We don't want to use that arm. If um, they've had a mastectomy or breast removal, we want to stay away from that side. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why somebody would have an arm that we can't use. We're just going to ask them. Why would they stay away from an arm? Yeah. So when, I know we're not going to have a lot of practice on that, sorry. When we put this on the arm and we squeeze it, yeah. Remember, no blood in or out, right? We're compressing everything. Mm -hmm. Well, that means that all of the blood that's down here, that's currently in the bottom of the arm, mm -hmm. it's kind of stuck in place. And because of that, um, the fluid inside the arteries and the veins mm -hmm. gets pushed out to make room for cells. Mm -hmm. So what we have is a transfer of fluid. So that the fluid part of the blood gets pushed out into the tissues. Well, when you have them, and you and I, it's no big deal because as soon as the blood pressure cuff comes off, our recycling center or lymph system gathers all that excess fluid, puts it back into circulation, no harm, no foul. When we have a mastectomy, we take lymph nodes away. So we get rid of our recycling center on that side. And if we trap fluid in the tissues, it's really hard to get it out. The arm can swell up like a sausage and not ever go down, ever. Well, it's kind of like if you have a sponge, you know, little cells of the sponge, right? Try to empty one cell. You can't, you just can't. You have to squeeze the whole sponge, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not easy to remove fluid. Mm -hmm that's in the in extracellular spaces. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so in order to take a blood pressure, what I'm gonna do is have her stretch her arm out, palm up. I'm gonna lay this over her arm. I'm gonna find her artery, it's right there. I'm gonna secure the cuff around her arm. I'm gonna put my stethoscope in, ear tips facing away from me. And I really want to sandwich this onto the skin. I mean, really squish it in there because I don't want any air to breathe sound. So I'm going to put this here, sandwich it in, and I'm going to use this bulb and valve assembly. I'm going to close the close it off, inflate, and you're going to see that needle go up. I'm going to go up to somewhere around 160, 180. And I'm going to slowly open this valve. See how slow that needle's moving? And I'm listening for thumbs. Right there. Thumb, 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 
Tam, 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 tam. And no more thumbs. I'm going to keep listening. Notice that needle never, ever stops. All the way to zero. And her blood pressure was 132 over 80. Now, if you remember our normal values, that's a little bit high. I'm not overly concerned because she's learning a new skill today, which makes her a little bit nervous. She's also on camera, <laughs> which can make you a little bit nervous. That's not unusual. Thank you. Everything affects temperature in the room affects you, how you're feeling, your rest level. Our blood pressure is very minute by minute. Even the fact that you have to pee will affect your blood pressure. It's constantly moving, constantly adjusting. I have a question that has been stupid. I know you said this most of the question before. <laughs> I'm just extra. But what if you can't use either arms? Okay, so I'm going to point back over here. CNAs do. Who does abnormal? The nurse. If we don't have two good arms, if I don't have an arm I can use, that's not a CNA task, that's a nurse task. Mm -hmm. Now, delegation is a thing. Remember we talked about delegation on the first day? Mm -hmm. I could train you on that patient. The chances are I'm probably going to do it myself because there's a higher level of complexity here. Mm -hmm. Good. They take it on the ankle or the top of your ankle, or what would you take the other one? Could, yeah, could. And you don't like the forearm? Could, yes. The, the wrist is another area. Anywhere you have an artery that can be easily oh, okay. compressed. So, yeah, you can take it on the leg, you can take it on the ankle, you can take it on the wrist. Um, but there are some variations. And again, that's not really a CNA test. Right. That would be more of a nursing test. We don't take routine blood pressures on those patients. We don't do screening. But we would only take a blood pressure for you. Yeah. We're going to reduce the frequency. Good? Okay. So we did not get to finish blood pressure. Please do not practice on anyone at home yet. I'm out of time, unfortunately. So we're going to pick this up again on Wednesday. Bring your blood pressure cups and stuff. If it's on Tuesday, bring a can if you have one. Um, and I'm going to teach you how to inflate and deflate. So it's going to throw our schedule off just a little bit, which is okay. That's it's okay. Well, we've got some time at the end that I can use to make up, you know, some, some time. But we will <laughs> revisit this on Wednesday. So let me get you your uh, review sheets. Yes. I know she said that um, you can also bring a fan. Is that more for just someone to squeeze? You shouldn't, your patient should not be squeezing anything because that exercises the arm, which is going to put more uh, need for blood flow. Increased blood flow is increased pressure. And it will be higher. Right. So we, we want them relaxed. So what is the can? The can is because you guys are going to be practicing inflating and deflating mm -hmm. with that bulb and valve assembly. Remember I said it's all you? Yeah. I want you to practice on the can, not your neighbors. Because remember, well, the more you take a blood pressure, the higher it goes. Right. So I'm trying to reduce the stress on your neighbor. Uh -huh. Can I just use my yeah. okay. So there's a fan or a light fan? Yeah, I've got some here. Um, I just don't have enough for everybody. But just, yeah, like a light soft fan. Anything that's about the size of the human arm that isn't going to compress easily. Like if you try to use this water bottle, the cup will fit around it, but it compresses. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I can I join the online getting into some of the activities without getting an invite from you. It, there's uh, 10 or 11 lessons that are unlocked, but it's not going to get you far. Okay. Okay. I'll just have you send me another one. So, yeah, I'll send you another one. So, come over to my desk real quick. I'm wondering if that's the reason. Let me just real quick. I'm just trying to see if there's a place where you have to work again. Uh, no, I'm actually off. I just wanted to uh, address any questions I have on YouTube, but my chat isn't loading. All right, YouTube guys, if you can still see me, I'm sorry, my chat is not loading. I can't see your questions, but join us tomorrow for our game show at 11 Eastern and Wednesday we'll be back in class. Hope to see you there. Until next time, happy caregiving. Yeah, so she's following